Okay, so before before uh, moving further ahead, you know, uh, just uh, a standard disclaimer that you know the content is only intended for uh, healthcare professionals in India, and uh, we are not uh, you know uh, providing any any kind of uh, you know uh, Pfizer uh, sensitive information. Uh, these are mostly based on uh, data and uh, information which are publicly available, and uh, whatever views and opinions uh, which will be mentioned in the presentation are uh, strictly mine and uh, these are not endorsed by Pfizer and should not be associated uh, with, with Pfizer by uh, any means okay and uh, just keep in mind that you know these these slides are intended for uh, educational purposes and uh, uh, we would suggest not to you know have uh, these uh, distributed uh, outside uh, this this current forum uh, without uh, uh, Pfizer or uh, my approval Uh, some uh, acknowledgements uh, that I would like to make. So, uh, first of all, uh, Christian Russell Ray, so who is uh, heading the uh, uh, GBDM team uh, for uh, Philippines and is also the uh, head of statistics uh, in India. So, he has you know, been a very uh, uh, motivational force uh, in terms of encouraging us uh, to uh, you know, connect with uh, different institutes, uh, whether medical or any other academic institutions. And uh, you know, move forward uh, with with the you know focus of uh, you know uh, enhancing the knowledge about statistics and then creating an awareness. So um, uh, he he has been you know a, a great uh, uh, inspiration uh, behind uh, our uh, uh, development of the team uh, in Chennai and as well as you know uh, conducting this workshop. And then I would like to, you know, uh, also acknowledge uh, some of the uh, statistical programming uh, colleagues uh, with Priya Ayer, who is the head of SPA, India and Philippines, and then uh, Kirotika, Karthik, Nikita, and Pedia Sami. So uh, we uh, also, you know, uh, initiated a stats for non-stats uh, lecture series uh, in Chennai and Philippines uh, last year. And some of the materials that I will be presenting over here uh, were actually prepared by them. <clears throat> which is also, you know, uh, which I which I feel would be also, you know, beneficial uh, for this uh, team uh, to know more. So I'll start off with, uh, you know, the fundamentals of uh, exploratory data analysis. So I'll, I'll primarily will be talking about, you know, some of the principles and uh, uh, motivations and also, you know, the, the philosophy behind, behind doing uh, an exploratory data analysis. So we, we we hear about this term EDA, uh, you know, uh, now you know most most of the time, uh, especially in your field and and of course in 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 the field of statistics as well. So what is exploratory data analysis? So it is not like you know a single analytical approach or uh, a single method uh, to to explore data. Uh, I would say that it it is kind of like a, a holistic approach or a philosophy uh, by which you know you need to analyze uh, data. Uh, by employing uh, various no different kinds of techniques, most of which are graphical. Now, why 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 there is a need to do you know such kind of exploratory data analysis? Uh, how it helps us? So, first of all, it it gives uh, it maximizes uh, the insight uh, that we can have uh, into a data set, which might not be possible if you just look at the data as a whole, or you know you 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 pull out some bunch of summary statistics. Uh, before before going into that you know you need to understand that you know whether the data is providing any any uh, you know important insight and eda helps us to maximize that insight okay uh, it also helps to undercover the underlying structure so you know what 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 data structure we are looking into what is the type of the data what is the type of variable you know what kind of association we we have you know whether whether we can think of a linear uh, uh, you know, uh, linear model, or is there any curvature? So, so all these kinds of you know structure, uh, EDA helps us to uncover. It also helps us to extract important variables. So, you know, suppose you know we are we are playing around with 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 few variables, and we see that you know some of the variables are more associated with each other uh, as compared to others. So, does this association uh, gives us any any new insight? Does this association means that there, there could be a new signal uh, that needs to be further explored. So EDA helps with that as well. Uh, it also helps us to detect outliers and anomalies. So suppose you know you, you have a bunch of data 
and you have you know certain data points which are totally different uh, from the rest of the data set so are these outliers now if they are outliers you know why you know we are we are seeing this is it is it you know part of the process by which the data is generated that we anticipate that there might be outliers or it could be that there might be some measurement error for which you know we are we are detecting you know values which are totally different uh, from the remaining majority of the values so eda helps us with that as well and then you know as as you build on on your you know on your philosophy or uh, the technique of uh, employing different graphical methods uh, to look into the data it also helps us to test some underlying assumptions so you know in 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 most of the you know majority of you know uh, clinical trials or you know even in in publications we, we we talk about normality assumption right so you know the data data follows a normal distribution and you know most of the things you know kind of uh, that that have been developed initially in terms of data analysis or hypothesis testing those are in line with this normality assumption now while while doing eda it it can also you know help us to understand that whether the normality assumption holds or not or do we need to you know explore something else and then it also helps to develop parsimonious model so you know as i mentioned earlier that you know you might have a dependent variable and a set of uh, explanatory variables but you know some of them might be important some of them might be not so how you can you know cut short uh, your uh, total data structure so that with the use of you know a few uh, parameters you are able to explain the phenomenon okay and then finally you know you can also determine optical optimal factor setting so you know how how much you know uh, so if you are, if you are talking about say one particular variable uh, it might have uh, uh, different factors uh, so how do you uh, you know uh, uh, you know what what levels of factors uh, do you think uh, it it would be important uh, to to identify that whether whether there is any trend or any pattern in the data so the moral of the story is that eda is basically an approach it's it's not a set of techniques and it's it's also not like you know uh, a, a simple rule like 1 plus 1 equals to 2 you know you need to i mean and 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 there is not a particular sequence that okay i need to start off with a scatter plot then uh, maybe i can i can look at a box plot no you know it it's it's a holistic approach uh, and it's more of a philosophy and attitude on how a data analysis should be carried out so you know if you have you know a set of tools set of graphical techniques you know employ that one after the other not necessarily in a particular sequence or you know uh, in a particular format but whatever you feel intuitively that would help you to understand that what's going on what's what's the story behind it okay so that's that's what you know the difference between you know uh, talking about eda as you know a technique versus a, a, an approach you know most of the time you'll see that people talks about eda and then go straight into the techniques but instead i would i would stress on the fact that think of this as more of a philosophy of how data analysis should be carried out okay so as i so 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 now you know let's let's uh, you know go go uh, a bit into you know the, the the philosophy okay so as i mentioned that you know sometimes you know in in many journals or in in many uh, you know uh, uh, web resources you will see that you know eda mostly refers to <coughs> statistical graphics and 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 most of them and most of the time they are they are almost you know interchangeable that you know eda means you know you have to explore through graphs but it's it's exactly not identical okay statistical graphics is more, more of a collection of techniques you know where you are you're focusing on you know a data characterization aspect and when you when you when you apply all those collection uh, in a, in a very systematic way to to understand the pattern that whole process is the eda okay so eda as i mentioned so so it, it it's more of a it, it encompasses a larger avenue okay so eda basically you know helps us to see that what's going on in the data okay whether it is able to reveal any structure or any 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 pattern and then you know think about the assumption we, we you know most of the time we do the other way we, we see the data we, we uh, something you know gets stuck to our mind that okay i would be fitting a normal distribution over here or a t distribution and, and then i'll analyze eda is just saying that just the opposite first you 
look into your data first you understand your data and then you think that whether you know uh, based on whatever understanding you have whether now the assumptions that you want to fit in whether that follows or not okay and so uh, finally i would like to touch on the point that you know it heavily uses the collection of techniques which we call statistical graphics so graphical you know uh, analysis is a big part of eda you know uh, not disregarding that you know the summary statistics are not important they are of course important and we will cover over here as well but most of it is the graphical techniques okay so it it relies heavily on the graphical techniques but it is not identical to a statistical graphics so that's the thin line between you know calling calling eda as a collection of statistical graphics uh, and and you use it to explore your data and and talking about you know it it it's it's a broader umbrella where you use different tools most of which is based on graphical techniques and see that what's going on in your data before making any assumption now what is the history behind eda so the the seminal work goes back in in 1977 uh, to john tukey so you know i i i really consider him as you know and like me you know most of the statisticians do you know consider uh, professor john tukey as as the uh, you know hero or or role model so he did some seminal work and you know he is considered as the pioneer uh, in 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 the field of uh, exploratory data analysis and if you look and if you look into his original work you will see that you know you can you know most of the time now and also you know with, with the assistance of you know uh, advanced uh, you know computational power we we mostly think about the complex things first okay but if you look at his book if you look at his initial papers you will understand that you know there are so many simple very simplistic techniques uh, by which you know you can explore your data and understand that you know what's what's the story going behind uh, between uh, behind 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 this data so you know if you have time you know go go through his work and that will give you you know a lot more insight about uh, eda in general and then followed by that you know there were other noteworthy uh, noteworthy publications uh, like data analysis and uh, regression which was basically a joint work between uh, tukey and uh, uh, mosteller and then uh, there was also interactive data analysis by uh, hoglin in 1977 and then uh, you know a few years later uh, this this abc's of da eda which was a <coughs> a joint work between wellman and hoglin that also gained uh, a great follow so, so so again as i mean if you, if you look into their work you will see that there are you know so much simplistic techniques and i'll and i'll show one example of that Uh, by which you know you can you can understand your 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 data in a more deep way okay okay so what are the techniques that are that are typically followed in eda so as i mentioned that you know most of the eda techniques are graphical in nature but there are few quantitative techniques as well okay so why this you know heavy uh, you know uh, reliance on graphics because you know as i mentioned that you know when when we are when you are doing an eda you have to be very open minded okay uh, you cannot you know you know uh, stick into your mind that you know this is my assumption of the data uh, this is what my uh, you know uh, uh, hypothesis and this is how the data should fit in uh, eda says that you know have an open mind you look at your data understand what's going on and then you know cross check that whether you know the you know it it can be fit into you know certain assumptions or is it is it giving you some insight by which you can develop a new hypothesis okay or a new statement okay and uh, now you know with 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 more uh, advancement and uh, with the with the natural natural pattern recognition capabilities that that we all possess uh, you know these graphical techniques you know provides you an unparalleled power to carry out such uh, exploratory analysis okay okay the other thing is that you know the graphical techniques uh, which which are employed in eda they are most often very simple okay and 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 this is again you know carrying carrying from the philosophy of tukey uh, tukey 
John Tukey, that you know, you you look, you you think about the simple things first, then move into the complex parts. So you know, you can you can plot your raw data, such as you know, you can you can think about data traces, histograms, probability plots, lag plots, and understand that what's going on, what what the distribution looks like. You can also you know plot simple uh, statistics like the mean plots, standard deviation plots, or box plots. Okay, and then the third thing is that you you know, uh, position such plots so as to, you know, maximize the natural pattern recognition ability. So, you know, suppose uh, you, you are looking at different aspects of the same data, you know, you put it side by side and then see that, you know, how, how the pattern is changing. Uh, what, what, you know, one, one particular aspect of the graph is telling about the other aspect of a different graph and then understand that what's going on. Now, it, it, it will not come, you know, on in, in one single day. It, it takes, you know, days of practice but if you start simple if you if you if you think about the simplistic uh, things first you know you you you'll, you'll see that there will be some transition and you know things will fall into place and you you'll be able to you know uh, think about the pattern or or think about the story uh, in a more intuitive way rather than uh, you know uh, having some any preconceived notion now how does EDA differ from summary analysis? Now, again, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going slightly detour, you know, all this while I'm talking, talking about the fact that, you know, look at the graphs, look at the graphs, but I'm not, I'm not disregarding the importance of summary statistics or summary analysis. They, of course, have a major part to play in data exploration, in exploratory data exploration, uh, data analysis, okay? But how, but, uh, you know, how, EDA, you know, in particular differs from the summary analysis. So what, what do we do in a summary? And we'll, we'll also see that in detail in, in, in you know, uh, some of the later slides. So when I'm talking about a summary, I'm mostly talking about, you know, an analysis where basically I am reducing a data set. Okay. So basically suppose, you know, I have uh, the mean uh, uh, serum creatinine calculation of 1000 patients. So you can imagine that there will be thousand data points, right? Uh, if, if I'm collecting at one particular time point. Now, is it giving me any, any, any particular insight? Just if I look at all those thousand data points together at the same time, probably no. So I, well, what I need to do, I need to reduce that uh, data set. So I can think of, you know, what is the average serum creatinine or what is the median serum creatinine? How much is the variability from one subject to another? So basically I am reducing my data set to a bunch of you know single digit single numbers right so so that's that's mainly the motivation of doing a summary analysis it is quite passive in nature so what do i mean by passive that once you are done you know you cannot change it right so it it, it it's kind of you know uh, stands in, in in time you know it's not dynamic okay the focus lies in the past so what do i mean by that so you know already you have collected the data and now you you know that okay, this is my mean, this is my median, and and you know, that's that's all. So it, it has been done in the past. So you cannot, you know, until and unless you are you are collecting, you know, data for more subjects, you know, that 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 information that you have got is from some past occurrence that has happened. Okay, and quite commonly, the purpose basically is to arrive to some few key statistics, which I said that you know you can talk about the mean or the standard deviation. EDA, on the other hand, has a broader goal. So what is this goal? So the goal is to gain some insight, okay, into the engineering part. You know, engineer, when I'm talking about engineering, I'm mostly talking about the data engineering part, okay, not 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 the field in itself, or the scientific process behind the data, okay. So EDA is active and futuristic. Why I'm saying because as I said before that you know you are looking at the data and then you are trying to think about that you know whether my assumptions would fall into place or not, okay. So it is kind of you know giving insight about what you need to do in future so that's that's a major difference between uh, eda and summary okay and the third thing is that you know to understand the process and you know how to improve it in future eda uses the data as a window okay to peer into the heart of the process so you look at the data you understand what's going on what kind of relationship exists between the variables whether it is giving you any new insight, whether it is giving you any particular signal, and then you decide that, you know, what I can do with this data later on, or 
with the information that I have got, maybe I can apply that to another similar data set and see that whether there is some consistency or not. <coughs> so that's what the... Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry for interruption. So uh, uh, there are some uh, comments coming to chat box. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to intimate you, if you want to uh, attend those things after the end of the presentation, that is fine. Yeah. Or if, yeah. if you want to make uh, the interactions uh, kind of uh, presentation, so you can have a look on the chat box and you can also put okay. your comments. So, uh, so so let me finish this part and then I can I can probably okay. come to the... Okay. Okay. Just to inform you, I just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was actually you know, following it. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay, so the next thing is that, you know, what, what are the EDA goals? So, you know, if I'm doing an EDA, but there, there should be certain goals in mind, right? So what are those goals? The primary goal is to maximize the analyst, uh, analyst's insight into the data set and the underlying structure of the data set, okay? And you can do that by specific items that you want to extract from the data set. So what is the primary goal? Primary goal is to maximize the insight. And that, you know, helps and, and that can be obtained through different perspectives. So the first one is that, you know, you can, you can, you know, probably get a good fitting model. Okay. So good fitting model means, you know, a parsimonious model. So you have, you know, a uh, few explanatory variables that are able to explain uh, your, your response variable. You, you can identify a list of outliers. Okay. You can have a sense of robustness that, you know, how much robust this particular trend is. Uh, in, in your particular data set. Some estimates of the parameters, okay? Uncertainties that, you know, obviously, you know, as, you know, in the field of statistics, it's mostly, you know, how you deal with the uncertainties because, you know, the, the major goal or the primary goal is always to, you know, define uh, what the population looks like. But in reality, we, we cannot do that, right? So that's why we have to rely on a sample. And, and then, you know, for a, for a statistician, the goal is to make that sample as much as a good representative of that population, right? So, you know, in, in doing so, you know, how much uncertainty is there, whether it's it's too much deviating away from, you know, what, what the population should look like, or, you know, I, I have a reasonable estimate uh, by which I can ex extrapolate for the population. So all those uncertainties, you know, you, you can get some idea. A ranked list of important factors. So, which are the factors that are playing, uh, you know, the most important role uh, in, in 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 a particular process by which you know you are looking uh, by with which you are trying to explore. Okay, and then conclusion as to whether the individual factors are statistically significant. So, this is you know again going back to the fact I was talking about that you 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 see some pattern, you see some insight. It might lead you to some you know definition of a new hypothesis. So over there, you know, you can now test that whether, you know, the, the factors or, or you know, uh, whatever uh, the, the assumptions that you have, uh, those are statistically significant or not. And also, you know, on a, on a more holistic way, what would be the optimal setting uh, by which, you know, you can, you can uh, you know, explain such trends or patterns. So again, I'll focus on the insight. So what do I mean by insight? Insight implies detecting and uncovering the underlying structure of the data. So you have the data, you, you try to investigate, you try to uncover as much as possible. But of course, you know, don't kill your data. So that, that's, a, that's a joke that, that does round, uh, you know, in the field of statistics that, you know, do not, do not kill your data. So, you know, do whatever, you know, you're, you're supposed to do to a certain extent to understand that, you know, what's, what's going on uh, you know, behind uh, the, the numbers. And what is the role of graphics over here? So as I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, in EDA or in statistics uh, in general, it can be classified into two broader parts. One is the quantitative part. The other one is the graphical part. So quantitative part is, you know, all these statistical procedures, you know, you know hypothesis testing, ANOVA, point estimates, confidence interval, regression, etc. And on the other hand, you, you have, you know, a large collection of statistical tools you know, and, we, and, and, and those are often called, you know, the graphical techniques, uh, which you can utilize. So uh, EDA, as I mentioned that, you know, it's, it's the philosophy of using these graphical tools uh, in a more wise manner. And the graphical tools can be, you know, scatter plots, histograms, box plots, probability plots. And EDA in, in particular relies heavily on this similar graphical techniques. 
so let's look at this example to to understand that you know why i am saying that you know eda using graphs help so if you look at this particular data set so suppose uh, you have data y and x okay so y is basically the decrease in weight after taking some drug abc and x is the number of days uh, for which the subject took the drug okay so y is the reduction in weight and x is the number of days the subject took the drug now i can do you know summary statistics so you know i have 11 observations i calculate the mean of x mean of y uh, you know if you if you have some basic idea about the uh, you know uh, the uh, regression or the you know uh, simple linear regression y equal to a plus bx so i can i can also get some estimates of that as well okay and i can also get the correlation between the two so a fairly high correlation between x and y okay so if you look at this particular aspect it, it is giving us information it is valuable but very limited insight okay let's look at this part so it's the same data but now i have used a scatter plot okay so 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 basically on x axis i i have the x uh, x axis and y axis and uh, basically you know i'm 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 plotting the data uh, and and trying to see if, if there is any particular pattern okay so you see over here that the data set behaves like a linear curve right so if you if you imagine you can you can draw a line in between these data points you can see that you know they are they are fairly linear in nature right so you know if if you want to you know if someone wants to justify that you know i will use uh, you know a, a spline regression or uh, you know a quadratic uh, equation to to fit the data there is no justification because you know a, a simple uh, a linear model would probably do the job for you the other thing is that you know the vertical spread of the data appears to be of equal height irrespective of the x value so you can see about this this vertical height so these are you know pretty much similar irrespective of the value of x so these informations you were not able to get by by just looking at the summary statistics so that's why you know while while you, if if you plot the data if you if you explore certain graphical techniques that definitely helps you to to understand more about your data now let's look at this example so now imagine i have you know other you know similar data set so over there i had x and y now suppose i have x2 y2 x3 y3 x4 y4 so now you know think about this as you know different trials where you had you know subjects <coughs> whose weight were reduced after taking the drug for a certain number of days okay so if you look at this particular data set x2 y2 you know i am i am getting you know very similar uh, identical values as i got for data set 1 okay the quantitative analysis for data set 3 and 4 so this bunch and this bunch they are also you know giving giving me you know similar information so a mean of 9 uh, for for the x 7.5 for the y you see the uh, estimates for the intercept and slope they are pretty much similar uh, even the correlation looks similar so you know if i don't explore the data further you know what i would typically you know people would do the mistake is that they would also think that okay uh, over here it was linear in pattern so maybe over here also uh, since i am getting you know similar estimates for the summary statistics maybe the relationship is also linear over here but that's not the end of story if you now plot the data you see things looks like this okay so this is my data set 1 which i talked about earlier you can see that it it can be you know explained by a linear pattern but if you see data set 2 can you can see that there is a clearly quadratic nature the data set 2 okay if you look at data set 3 it has an outlier over here okay you see most of the data points are lying over here and you see that one particular point is over here so probably this is an outlier okay if you look at data set 4 this is basically a victim of a poor experimental design with a single point being far removed from the bulk of the data set okay so now you can understand that why 
I was stressing on the fact that you should do your graphical exploration first because these are the insights which were not available and, and which are not possible to obtain if you just look at the summary statistics. Okay, so that's what the goal is that you have an open mind, you look at your data, and then you try to understand that what is the underlying structure of your data. Having said that, I'm not saying that quantitative statistics are wrong, but just in themselves, they are incomplete. Okay, so once again, I would stress on the fact that EDA deliberately postpones the model selection until you, you have you know, some you know, very conclusive evidence that whatever assumptions you are trying to put into that fits in well, okay? So that you have a more scientific conclusion. But before doing that, you explore your data and understand that what's going on behind, behind that and then move into the next step. So this is the last part uh, of, of this particular uh, uh, topic. So as I mentioned that, you know, uh, John Tukey, you know, gave us some, you know, wonderful, very simple uh, uh, tools uh, to, to, to do exploratory data analysis. So, and, and this is one of my favorite, which is the stem and leaf plot. So what do we do over here? So imagine uh, I have a random sample of 64 subjects uh, who, were select, uh, who were selected to take part in a phase two trial uh, to test a new oncology drug, say XYZ. Uh, in order to delay the relapse of AML, okay? So basically, this is the number of days till the relapse happens, okay? So for the first subject, you know, uh, after 111 days, a relapse happens. For the second subject, after 85 days, a relapse happens, okay? So again, you know, if you, you can probably, you know, do the summary statistics, uh, you, can, you can probably plot, uh, but you know, what uh, uh, Tuki uh, showed us is, something very, very, very simple. So what he did, he basically divided each data point into a stem and leaf. So that's the basic idea that you divide each data point into a stem and leaf. So if you imagine our first data point, 111, so that can be divided into a stem of 11 and a leaf of one. Similarly, 85, if you look over here, that can be considered as something with a stem eight and leaf five. Now, when you look at the next number, that also has a stem eight. So both of them have the same stem, but the leaves are different. So, so there are two leaves corresponding to the stem of value eight. And this is how you plot the entire data. Okay, so six is the stem, eight is the leaf. So that means that I had a data point 68. Seven is the stem, five and eight are the leaves. So that means I had a data point 75 and 78. Similarly, for all the others. Okay. And that's how you create the stem and leaf plot. Now, what is this in what 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 uh, information these are giving me, which was probably not obtained by, by looking at the entire data set in whole? So it is giving me an insight that maybe you see the distribution is bell shaped. So you can imagine that if I draw a line from here like this, it represents like a bell-shaped curve, right? Most of the days are in 90s and 100s. You see, most of the leaves are corresponding to the stem of 9 and the leaf and the stem of 10, okay? The smallest day is 68 and the largest is 141. So some very basic information I am getting by you know, applying a very simple technique, which again, you know, you don't really need to understand statistics over here at all. You can just take your data and, you know, think about the stem and leaf and just see how, how the pattern looks like. Okay. You don't need to apply any complex statistics, you know, before uh, understanding the underlying data structure. So that's the beauty of uh, stem, and, uh, stem and leaf, which was, you know, pioneered by John. Okay. So before I move on to you know the different types of data, so maybe I can you know take in uh, the, the the question. Okay, uh, so the first question is that can you please throw some light on methods to handle outliers? Okay, so I will you know give one uh, example uh, which is which is the box plot. 
uh, by which you know you can you know uh, look uh, into you know how you can check the outliers now in order to handle outliers you know there are different techniques uh, which might not be you know in 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 today's scope you, you know you can you can think about doing uh, you know data transformation you know the simplest thing is you throw away the data and you know uh, do the analysis on the remaining part and then include the data and again do the analysis to see that how much the estimates have changed okay so so there are certain techniques uh, by which you can uh, you know handle uh, such uh, outliers okay the next thing is that uh, is it right to say that eda is useful in hypothesis generation yes you know as 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 i stressed on the fact that you know once you you understand the underlying structure of the data you know who knows you know you might get some different pattern uh, some some different story uh, which might you know lead you to you know uh, doing a hypothesis generation and that is you know uh, a very common practice in clinical trials so you know if you have if you have looked into you know uh, say a pfizer study or any other you know sponsors uh, you know clinical trial whether it's a phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 you will see that there are you know a limited number of objectives you know pro probably a primary objective or you know a co primary objective followed by a bunch of secondary objectives and then you have some exploratory objectives okay now why because you know while we are designing the trial you know obviously we need to understand about certain aspects like the logistical part the timing the costs and everything and you know we need to understand that what is the most important question that we are trying to answer by doing this trial now having said that you know one once you are brainstorming about you know the study design or what could be the different objectives you might come with a bunch of different uh, set of uh, uh, analysis that you intend to do which might not be feasible at the time of you know designing the study or once the trial is ongoing now once the trial ends all those objectives or all those analysis that you intended to do you can do that and and that happens which leads to you know ad hoc publications which might lead to manuscripts so these are basically coming out from the exploratory data analysis so so once you have all the clinical trial data and the trial has ended now we can explore we can we can understand that okay you know we might have looked at into the data from the say we have just used the full analysis set uh, to analyze and maybe we have used you know subgroups of age but there might be you know other subgroups so what about you know uh, her to positive her to negative you know if you know let's let's do a subgroup by the biomarker status or you know let's do a subgroup uh, using some baseline characteristics why where we anticipate that you know the results might be a bit different and you know if we if we see that you know there is an overwhelming evidence that maybe you know one particular subgroup uh, responds very well to the treatment that often leads to a new trial where you know you you focus on that particular subgroup and you know the precursor is basically coming out from the initial study that you designed <coughs> so so i hope that that answers uh, that that question uh the next one how do you address multiplicity in exploratory data analysis so multiplicity probably uh, you know you, you may not be able to do that because uh, that's that's a, you know different philosophy so you know multiplicity you know it kind it might come from you know different uh, avenues you know say you know if you look at your data multiple number of times uh, or you know if you analyze your data multiple number of times you know you might come across you know a a, a particular uh you know statistically significant result uh which you know uh, might be you know out, out you know just just due to chance so you you need to appropriately you know spend your type one error uh in order to minimize that multiplicity so so that's that's you know totally that that's more you know in line with the you know hypothesis testing and you know more advanced topics on hypothesis testing so i don't think you know eda would would, would probably help you uh in 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 exploring that uh in uh, to to address multiplicity okay. any any other questions uh, before we move on to the next part and 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 sanchita you know please feel free to you know schedule uh, you know a, a, a break in between because you know sometimes you know uh, you know it 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 might be a bit overwhelming you know for a for a non stats crowd so you know feel free to you know stop me if you if you think that there might be an appropriate time to take a break 
Sure. Uh, so, Dr. Pritam, whenever you feel that you can take a break in between the topic, because mm-hmm. um, it's in continuation, we mm-hmm. can pause and take a break for around 10 minutes. Okay. 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 So, uh, maybe uh, uh, let me, you know, cover this particular uh, uh, subtopic, then types of data, and then we can, we can take a 10 minutes break. Sure. That sounds okay. good. Okay. Okay. So, now... Uh, I will be, you know, focusing on different types of data. So either qualitative or quantitative. So all this while, you know, I talked about, you know, you have your data, you need to plot your data or, you know, do some summary statistics to see. But again, what kind of plot you will be using, you know, what kind of summary statistics you'll be using, that varies, you know, from, from one data type to another. So we need to understand uh, what is the type of data before, you know, applying the right technique. Uh, to, to, to check the pattern, okay? So, uh, before, before going into that, you know, just, just the motivation that, you know, uh, why do we need descriptive statistics, okay? Because we, we are talking about data. So, eventually, you know, if, if, you, if you have been part of any, any clinical trial or if you have seen any you know, published results of clinical trial, you'll see that, you know, we, we provide you know, bunches of a uh, bunch of tables uh, with, with, with descriptive statistics, right? The mean, the median, range, standard deviation, etc. Why, why do we need this? You know, what is the motivation behind this? Okay. So you can imagine that, you know, when we are talking about uh, a, a clinical trial. So for example, you know, suppose, you know, this, 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 this blue circle. So this is suppose, you know, all patients uh, with the studied disease. So suppose, my, my disease indication is AML. So, you know, the population would be all the subjects, all the patients that have AML in this entire world. Now, can I do a trial considering all those uh, patients together? No, obviously, that's, that's a big no. We cannot do that. So, we have to rely on a sample. So, that sample is basically the representation of the clinical trial. Okay. So, again, when you're talking about a clinical trial, so suppose now, say, Pfizer conducts a trial. Uh, the study name is A1234, which, which includes the subjects uh, who have satisfied some inclusion exclusion criteria and, and, and they have been diagnosed with M. Okay. Now, again, from, from this subjects enrolled in this particular trial, say the number of subjects is 500 or 1000, okay, or even 100. So I will get large amounts of data, right? So I will get, you know, baseline characteristics. So suppose, you know, for subject one, I might have different variables uh, which are corresponding to different baseline characteristics, age, height, weight, you know, BMI, uh, other, you know, disease characteristics at baseline, okay, all those things, okay. I might have efficacy data. Now, suppose, you know, the subjects have taken the drug, you know, now I'm looking at some molecular response after 16 weeks of treatment, okay, uh, you know, or some relapse rate, whatever. Again, I will have a bunch of efficacy variables corresponding to each subject. And similarly, safety as well. You know, I will, I will have data on labs. I will have data on drug exposure. I will have data on adverse events. Now, again, bunch, bunch of data sets corresponding to safety. Now, what do I do with that data? You know, I, I, I cannot just provide, you know, you know, multiple pages of listings to health authority, right? And ask, and ask them, that, okay, this is... This is the trial that was conducted. These are the data corresponding to the subject. Now find out whether my drug is effective or not. We don't do that, right? We, we need to, you know, figure out that whether we can get some meaningful interpretation. We can get some, you know, meaningful information from this whole bunch of data sets. And that information is provided by the descriptive statistics in some way or the other. Okay? So that's the motivation in, in, in doing descriptive statistics. Okay. Now, when we talk about data, you know, there are two different major sources of data. So, what are they? The first one is the primary data. So, what is primary data? So, this is collected by the researcher for a specific purpose. So, in a clinical trial context, you know, we are basically collecting the data to assess the efficacy and say, safety of, you know, drug ABC. Okay. Or if you are collecting the data through any surveys, interviews, or experiments. So, for example, you know, in, in, in Tata Memorial Hospital, you know, I'm sure that, uh, you know, the, the MDs, uh, MD students or, you know, the doctors who are pursuing their MDs, they probably have you know, one particular part 
uh, in their curriculum where they have to you know conduct uh, they have to do uh, a thesis uh, which mostly involves you know for, uh, you know a small experiment where you know you you either randomize or you you have a single arm trial and and you know you you look at say for example the uh, person uh, the patient's responsiveness to radiation okay after after certain days of treatment so you collect all the information relevant information that could help you with the data analysis part so that is also primary data collection okay and primary data prime uh, basically aims at understanding and solving the research problem at hand okay so you want to understand and solve the research problem and that's why you want to collect that primary data directly from the source and analyze and see that what what conclusion you are reaching out to secondary data on the other hand is basically collected by third party okay so this is basically someone other than the primary investigator or researcher the collected data is used for another alternate purpose so maybe the initial data was collected for a one particular purpose but then if you are using it for a totally different purpose that's a secondary data that you are using okay and an example of that is you know also you know the data collected through different government health records or published articles so those are all secondary data that you are dealing with so those are the different two sources so this will again you know help you to understand the differentiation between primary and secondary data so over here you can see that you know you are directly interviewing the subject and collecting the data so that's a example of primary data over here you know you probably have you know old records you know some medical journals or published uh, articles and from there you are collecting some information and based on that you probably you know do some analysis so that's secondary data <coughs> similarly if you are looking into online resources of you know probably you know a survey that has already been conducted and now you are analyzing it you know either to you know substantiate the initial claim or you know to do it to do some other analysis so that's a secondary data you can also think about you know observational data so for example you know uh, a subject has been exposed to a drug and then you are observing you know after a certain number of days that how the patient is responding so that's observational data that is also primary data collection whatever measurements you are performing so you are directly measuring from the subject right their temperature or their uh, spo2 uh, uh, height weight so those are all primary data if you are using survey results that's a secondary data and then finally again if you are if you're going back to the journals and looking at published data that's also an example of secondary data so that's the differentiation between primary and secondary data now i move on to the types of data so the first one is qualitative data so what is qualitative data so these are data that describes qualities or characteristics okay that's all and they are also sometimes commonly referred to as categorical data so what are examples of uh, qualitative data so gender okay male female not reported or you know so so that means that you know it's either male or female so i am assigning a quality or a characteristic to that data okay race okay or whether the subject is caucasian or asian or african that's all okay i i i don't have you know an ordering that you know male better than female or you know caucasian better than african there is no ordering over here it's just a characteristic i am assigning to the data that i am collecting so that's what a categorical data or a qualitative data does you know when you are talking about smoking history yes or no okay severity of adverse event whether it's a mild adverse event moderate or severe okay so there is a differentiation now which will i'll talk about it but these are all examples of qualitative data now this qualitative data can be further categorized into nominal and ordinal so what is nominal so nominal is data with distinct categories that do not have any order or ranking so for example gender uh, race ethnicity so male female so male is distinct from female right so distinct categories caucasian is distinctly different from asian okay but there is no ordering i cannot say caucasian better than asian or caucasian worse than asian right i cannot do that so it has distinct categories but no ordering so that's a 
nominal data. Now, in this case, you know, there is there is a special scenario where if it just has only two possible categories. So, for example, smoking status. Either you are smoking or you are not smoking. Yes or no. Or survival status. Whether the subject has survived or the subject has died. There are no in between or no other possibility that you can think of. So, when there are only two possible choices corresponding to a nominal data, we call that as binary data. Binary means two, only two possible outcomes. Okay. So, binary data is a special case of nominal data. Now, in the field of qualitative data, when I have data with distinct categories and a logical ordering, then they are called as ordinal data. So, severity of adverse event, mild, moderate, severe. I know that someone who is having a moderate adverse event, obviously their condition is more worsening as compared to someone who has a mild adverse event. Right? So, there is a logical ordering, but I cannot quantify that order. I know that there is an order, there is a distinct category. Mild is distinct from moderate, moderate is distinct from severe, and there is an ordering. Severe is more extreme than moderate, moderate is more extreme than mild. But I don't know by how much. Okay, I cannot say that, you know, if you are having a moderate adverse event, that means that you will probably have a tenfold more pain as compared to if you are having a mild adverse event. We cannot say that. So, distinct categories that has a logical ordering, that's what is an ordinal data. And distinct categories but no ordering, that's nominal data. Distinct categories with just two possible outcomes, that's a binary data, which is a special case of nominal data. Okay, So I hope that helps you understand what qualitative data is. Next, we move on to quantitative data. So what is quantitative data? Over here, data is measured in the form of numbers or counts. So that's why they are also called numerical data. So what do I what what are what are you know classic examples of that? Say height, weight, number of subjects for treatment group. So these are all examples of quantitative data because we are using some numbers, right, to to identify them or to measure them. Okay. Now again, this has different categories. The first one is discrete. So what is discrete data? So discrete data means that I have a countable number of distinct values. For example, number of subjects in a treatment group or number of adverse events by treatment. I will probably have, you know, one subject in a treatment group, two subjects in a treatment group, 100 subjects in a treatment group. I won't have 100.75 subjects in a treatment group, right? So it's a distinct countable number. I won't have 5.4 adverse events uh, corresponding to treatment A, right? I would probably have five adverse events or six adverse events. So these are distinct values, countable number of distinct values. So that's a discrete data. And then I have continuous data, which can take any numeric value within a given interval. For example, height. So suppose, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a study on uh, Indian subjects, you know, I would anticipate, you know, the height would be somewhere between, say, you know, uh, 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 4 feet uh, 10 inches to 6 feet 2 inches. And in between these, the, the subject's height can be anything. It can be 5 feet 1. It can be 5 feet 1.5. It can be 5 feet 1.666. Any value, any possible value between an interval, within a given interval. Similarly, for weight as well, you know, if I'm conducting a study for adults, I probably anticipate the weight would be would vary between, say, you know, uh, 60 to 100, for example. And between 60 to 100, the subject's weight can be any value. Okay, it can be a distinct value. It can be, you know, a, a value with the decimal point as well. So that's the differentiation between a continuous data and discrete data. Now, again, in continuous data, it can be further subcategorized into interval and ratio scale. So what are they? So in interval scale, the order and the exact differences between the values are known. Okay. So for example, you know, if you're, if you're measuring the body temperature, uh, uh, I think there is one, one, one type over here. Uh, so body temperature in Celsius uh, is, 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 is in the interval scale. Okay. Not, not Fahrenheit. Okay. 
So, <coughs> you know, I suppose, you know, a subject's body temperature is say, uh, you know, 35 uh, degrees centigrade and another subject's uh, temperature is 40 degrees centigrade, for example. So I, I, I know that, you know, the difference is five degrees centigrade, right? But it does not include true zero, okay? So, you know, suppose, you know, a subject's temperature is uh, 20 Celsius versus another subject's temperature is uh, 40 Celsius, 40 degrees Celsius. I cannot say that, you know, the temperature is twice as warm from one subject to another. I cannot say that because it does not include the true zero. So, although I am able to, you know, get the difference, you know, I know the order that, you know, 40 is more than 20 there is a difference of 20 degrees centigrade between subject one's temperature versus subject two's temperature. But I cannot say that, you know, 40 is twice as warm as 20. It does not include the true zero. Whereas in the ratio scale, it has same characteristics as interval, but it includes the true zero. So the classic examples over here is height or weight. So suppose, you know, someone's height is, uh, say, uh, three feet versus another person's height is six feet. So I can exactly say that, you know, subject number two is twice as tall as subject number one. Okay. You know, uh, if I'm talking about uh, true zero, you know, weight zero basically means, you know, weightless. Height zero basically means that, you know, there is no height. Whereas in, in temperature, when I'm talking about zero degree Celsius, it's not exactly zero. Zero has some value. Okay. I'm just determining, I mean, you know, not, I'm using the notation zero degree centigrade, but that, that doesn't mean that, you know, actually there is no temperature. Okay. Whereas in, in Fahrenheit, I can, I can do that. So I'll, I'll, when I, when I, you know, when, when Sanchita will probably resend the slide or I can, I can do it later on. I'll, I'll update that typo. So just an interpretation with an example that, you know, a weight of four grams is twice as heavy as two grams. Whereas, you know, a temperature of 10 degree centigrade is not twice as hot as Five degrees centigrade. So that's the difference between the interval and the ratio scale. Now uh, we'll we'll finish off with this knowledge check. So now you know uh, you can either uh, unmute yourself or uh, you know you can uh, 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 probably you know uh, just uh, uh, type in your response. So you see you know on your left you have a bunch of different variables. So gender height, body temperature at Celsius, race, you know, the, the amount of drug given to a subject, dose, number of events in medical history, uh, smoking history, uh, age severity, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, scale to check that, you know, uh, the quality of life. So, you know, I am, I am feeling better now. So, you know, you can either strongly disagree or disagree, neutral, agree, and then strongly agree. Okay. And then, you know, the number of days or number of months of stay in hospital. So if I ask, you know, you that, you know, what do you think gender or sex, you know, what kind of a variable it is? Any answers? Okay, I'm, I'm getting one as nominal. Everyone, everyone agrees that it's nominal or anyone has any different opinion? Okay. So I mostly see this as nominal. So it's it's straightforward, right? So male, female, right? So you know distinct categories, but no ordering. Okay, so it's a nominal scale. What about height? So height, you know, is it nominal, ordinal, discrete, interval, or ratio? So height is ratio. Yeah. Okay. So so. So first of all, it's it's a quantitative variable because you know we are using numerical data, right, to 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 you know uh, assign the outcome, and then you know as I mentioned that it includes the true zero. So I so I can uh, find the exact difference. I can have find the order, and I can also and 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 also there is true zero. Okay, so uh, that's why you know uh, uh, as I meant as 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 you. I've seen in the previous example, you know, someone with a height of six feet, they are twice as tall as someone with a height of three feet. So that's why it's the ratio scale, not interval, because, you know, over here we have the true zero. Okay. 
so that's why you know uh, so my so dr sujit so it's 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 not interval it's it's ratio because you know of the uh, reasons that i mentioned uh, so hope hope uh, it, it 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 clarifies uh, the doubt the next one uh, body temperature at celsius so quantitative interval right so again you know there is an ordering uh, you can find the exact difference but you don't have the absolute zero or the true zero so that's why you know uh, a temperature of 10 degrees centigrade cannot be considered as twice as hot as uh, a temperature of 5 degrees centigrade what about race race is nominal right so again you know distinct categories but no ordering what do you think uh, dose would be ratio so dose by dose i am saying you know the amount of drug ordinal uh, so uh, pukamala can you can you explain that why uh, you are saying this as ordinal and bhavesh why why do you think this is discrete any response so if you think about dose so it's the amount of drug you know the subject is exposed to right dose is the fixed amount okay but you know we we we, we okay so so i i i i understand from from where you're talking about but you know let let's not you know put put into the trial perspective in in general so suppose you know in a trial obviously you know you would you would expect you know the subject would be you know getting uh, the the dose of say 200 mg you know at each visit okay so uh, of course you know so 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 uh, then then it's a fixed amount but you know in general you know if you if you think about if you, if you leave aside the aspect of uh, you know uh, the, the the clinical trial or uh, any any experiment you know dose in itself you know it can take any value right so suppose you know uh, i might You know, I might say that you know the drug is potent between say you know ten microgram to hundred uh, microgram. So in between that, it can take any particular value. So from that perspective, you know I'm talking uh, doses ratio, okay? And because again, you know you you will be able to you know say that you know something is you know twice as strong you know in terms of dosage as as compared or you know at whatever times because it includes the absolute zero. So zero dose dose means actually you know the the subject. has not got any any drug okay what about the number of events in medical history number of events in medical history so that's discrete right because you can have one event two event three event smoking history i think that's straightforward that's nominal and uh, do you do you remember what is the special category lina yes exactly so that's that's the binary okay what about the next two uh, adverse event severity and you know i feel better now quality of life score so both are ordinal right because you know there is distinct categories and of course there is a logical ordering okay we cannot quantify that order but we know that you know you know strongly disagree obviously means you know it's a stronger opinion as someone saying uh, i just disagree okay and finally you know uh, if i if i'm talking about say number of days or number of months of stay in hospital what would that be discrete right right so i'm glad that you know most of you are able to give the right answer so that means that you know i'm 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 doing my job uh, you know probably well so these are the answers okay which most of you got it correctly okay so next topic would be on descriptive statistics but you know we probably can take a break of uh, 10 minutes maybe so uh, if you if you, if you have follow through you know the 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 principles of uh, eda you know i i said that you know uh, we 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 look into the data to to get some insights and we do that through you know graphical techniques or 
you know, some summary measures. And uh, in doing so, you know, as I said, that you know, the first important step is to identify the type of data. Okay, so that we have talked about that, you know, it can be qualitative or quantitative. And now, you know, based on the type of data that you have, you know, what kind of descriptive statistics uh, you can uh, apply in order to get some more information. Okay, so uh, when I'm talking about descriptive statistics, so basically, you know, I'm talking about how you can describe, present, summarize, and organize your data. Okay, so these are basically, you know, numerical calculations or representations uh, that you can do uh, based on the data that you have. Uh, and it can be done through tables or graphs. And the commonly used measurements uh, in, in doing the descriptive statistics are related to central tendency, frequency, spread or dispersion, and position. So when I'm talking about frequency, I'm mostly talking about the counts and percentages. Okay. When I'm talking about central tendency, I'll be focusing on the mean, mode, and median. When I'm talking about the spread or dispersion, I will be talking about the range, variance, standard deviation, and coefficient of variation. And then finally, when I'm talking about position, I'll be focusing on quartiles and percentiles. So we'll go through each of these topics individually. Okay. So what is frequency? So frequency is basically the number of times an observation occurs within the data. Okay. So, for example, you know, uh, I want to see that, you know, how many uh, subjects uh, were of uh, age 25. Okay. I see, you know, I, I, I get, you know, number of, I, I see, I get, you know, five subjects. And, you know, the total uh, sample size is 100. So, five out of 100 had an age of 25, for example, I'm saying. Or, you know, how many males versus how many females. Okay. So, that's where I'm, I'm talking about frequency. I just simply calculate the number of times an observation occurs within a data. The next thing is central tendency. So what do I mean by that? So central tendency refers to a single value uh, which describes the data set by identifying the central position within that data set. So, you know, in somewhere, you know, I'm talking about what is the average, you know, so central tendency is, you know, leading towards that philosophy that, you know, how you can, uh, how you can provide uh, an approximate of you know what would be the average value of a given given for a for a given data set so that's what central tendency does next we talk about the spread or dispersion so you have you might have you know uh, a bunch of data set you might identify that okay this is my average now how are each values differ from each other or from the central centrally defined value how much variation is there between one, data, one, one value of the observation versus the other, okay? So that gives me an idea about what is the spread or dispersion. And finally, the position. So this talks about the values at certain points or percentages of the data. So you, you, you probably might have heard about, you know, percentile. So, you know, this is the 90th percentile of the data, right? Or this is the, you know, 75th uh, percentile of the data, or this is the third quartile of the data. So that basically, I'm talking about the position beyond which or below which a certain proportion of the numbers fall or above which a certain proportion of the numbers are there. <coughs> so that's what position gives you an idea. So you can see that each of this aspect gives about gives you an idea about different, you know, uh, uh, different set of, you know, uh, what should I say, you know, essence of, you know, what, what, uh, you know the the data set is talking about. So I can I can talk about the frequency. I can talk about the average. I can talk about you know how much variability is there, or at what position the particular data point lies as compared to the other uh, observations. So start off with uh, frequency and percentages. So what is so over there? You know count or frequency. What is that? So basically, this is the number of occurrences of a corresponding value. Okay, and then percentage is that you divide that count by the total number of observations. So I'm sure most of you might have seen a table like this in a in a published clinical trial result. So you know, suppose I'm summarizing the demographic characteristics. 
okay, of a study x, y, z, one, two, three, four. Now the first variable over here is gender, so it's a nominal variable. It has three categories: male, female, and not reported. So five is the number of females that I found in thirteen subjects who got drug A. Okay, so my count of female subjects in drug A is five. So that's my count. And then if I divide five over thirteen, I get thirty-eight point five. So thirty-eight point five percentage of the subjects who were assigned to drug A are females. So see how 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 I am trying to derive you know important meaningful information from the original data set. So I count the number of females corresponding to drug A. Similarly, I can do it for drug B and then for total, and then I am dividing it by the total number of observations to find the percentage. Okay. So for nominal and ordinal data, this is the most preferred way of summarizing. You just count the frequency. You count the number of occurrences. And then you find the percentage. Okay. Similarly for ethnicity as well. So you know, in drug A out of thirteen subjects, eleven were not Hispanic or Latino, and so the percentage is is eighty four point six percent. Okay. So that's how you summarize a nominal or ordinal data. Fine. Now, another important aspect to understand over here is that. any continuous variable can be transformed into qualitative data by splitting the continuous scale in categories so you know in 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 many demographic table you might have seen that you know apart from providing you know the summary on what is the mean age what is the median age we also provide you know a summary of you know what is the number of subjects below age 65 and greater than equal to 65 or it can be any other threshold depending on the context okay so we we divide you know so so age in itself is a quantitative data it's a continuous variable right so what we are doing is we are dividing that data into two parts okay less than 65 greater than 60 greater equal to 65 and then we are seeing that what is the number of subjects who have age less than 65 so then basically we are deriving the counts and then the percentages so that can also happen okay the other special case is that if your data is binary okay and the two possible values are 0 and 1 then the proportion is also the mean of the sample so for example you know i i have a data set where the zero defines that you know the subject has not survived and one defines the subject has survived so basically i'm talking about survival status okay so you know instead of 0 and 0 or 1 you can you can think about 1 and 2 also but you know this is the simplistic approach so if you are denoting you know a subject who has died as 0 and a subject who has survived as 1 or you know the other way you know 0 means survive 1 means died then you will have data that looks like this right on the survival status it will have a bunch of zeros and ones so the mean is basically how many ones you have divided by the total sample size so over here i have 5 ones so 5 over 8 so that's the proportion of ones in the sample so if my one denotes the proportion of those who have survived so proportion of survival is 5 over 8 so that's a special case okay by by which you can uh, you know uh, have a more simplistic summary for a binary data now this is you know uh, another special scenario so you know when you just look at percentage they can sometimes be misleading okay so if you look at this particular table so i have you know subjects uh, who had ct scan and i have subjects who did not had ct scan and then if you look at this particular uh, column gastric ulcer yes no so what is the you know uh you know interpretation that most of us will give will say that 100% of the subjects uh, who were investigated with a ct scan had a gastric ulcer so it 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 really sounds dramatic right that you know probably it is you know kind of giving us a very you know uh, uh over uh, you know optimistic picture about the uh, you know uh, uh usefulness of the ct scan that you know whenever i am doing a ct scan i am able to detect a gastric ulcer but there's more to the story if you look at the 
actual number you know this this gives a different picture so only three subjects had ct scan versus 200 subjects who didn't have their ct scan so now it has a different impact right so whenever you are looking at you know data like this you know rather than you know just focusing on the percentage you should also look at the overall uh, number of subjects as well because over here you know maybe you know i i would have you know overestimated the efficacy of this of this ct scan based on just you know the percentage that you know 100% uh, you know uh, uh, true positive results uh, the ct scan is giving but in reality only three subjects uh, had you know uh, uh, had had gone through the ct scan and you know all all three had gastric ulcer so if you compare to the other group you know there were 200 subjects so basically you know they these group these two groups are you know non comparable you know i'm i'm comparing apples to oranges over here so that's that's you know one one particular aspect you need to keep keep in mind when you are dealing with uh, you know frequencies and percentage now this is the summary part that you know why I, I have qualitative data i can do the counts and percentages now how you can graphically represent that so for that we have the bar chart so it's a very simple simple chart what you do is you you have each categories right because you know you know qualitative care data has you know categories you know distinct categories whether it's nominal or ordinal it will have distinct categories so you have each category. So if you look at this example, so this is basically the NYHA functional class by dose group. So you have three different doses, high dose, low dose, and then another group with placebo. And you check on what is the percentage of subjects who showed improvement. Okay, and you just plot that. Okay, so that's the part chart that you can do. So you know now you know you from the picture also you can get an indication that you know subjects uh, who were assigned to a high dose they responded better the percentage of responders uh, or who showed improvement that's more uh, with with the group uh, that got that got high dose okay this is also another way of representing bar plot this is called the stacked bar plot so over here you have the number of autoimmune patients by cell source and cell donor donor type okay so over here uh, you have the adipose msc adipose sba plus uh, adipose SPF plus PRP, bone marrow MNC, etc. And then for each, you are calculating the different categories. Okay, and then you are plotting it or color coding. So in this particular group, you see that the percentage of autologous is more as compared to allogen. Okay, if you look at this particular group, this group has all the subjects who are allogen. Okay, so this is the pictorial representation of or the graphical representation of bar chart one of the graphical representation of uh, qualitative data which is bar chart this is another uh, you know very uh, commonly used uh, uh, chart which is called the pie chart okay so it, it basically represents a pie uh, this is this is a 3d pie chart and 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 i would highly recommend of not using it why I would I would show show in, the, in 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 some of the later slides, but this is also you know another popular way of representing qualitative data. So basically, you know you might have you know either frequency or percentages, and then you know you 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 consider them as you know angles of a circle corresponding to the overall response, and then accordingly you shade them or color code them depending on how much area of the chart they are covering. Fine. So, you know, suppose, you know, I have, you know, number of subjects enrolled per diagnosis. So I have 875 subjects who had multiple sclerosis. 429 had rheumatoid arthritis. This might be, you know, a representation of, you know, how much budget a company spends on different uh, phases of the track. Okay. So these type of data you can represent by a pie chart. And you have, you know, multiple, uh, you know, tools now, even you know the even even the simplest of all you know excel that also will will help you to create a pie chart uh, okay and then there are other you know softwares and tools as well by which you can generate a bar or a pie chart okay this is the third one which is called a dot chart so what is the dot chart so suppose you know i have data on 
most frequent uh, on therapy adverse event okay so i am basically plotting my percentages okay so i have my n so basically these are the counts of uh, adverse event corresponding to different doses or different treatment groups and uh, these are the different adverse events most common adverse events and then i am representing that particular percentage on this whole chart as a dot okay so all the red dots uh, over here corresponding corresponds to dose b and all these blues correspond to uh, uh, dose a okay so these are the same uh, adverse events so you know chronic obstructive airway versus chronic obstructive airway in dose a and dose b so you can see from here that uh, you know the subjects with uh, dose b uh, uh, had a sorry dose a had a slightly higher percentage okay they are around like 12% versus in dose a it was around 11% okay and similarly for the others as well so this is also a popular way of representing uh, qualitative data so you just you might have you know two different groups or three different groups uh, you calculate the count and the percentage corresponding to each category over here so with the, over here the categories are different adverse events and then you represent them with a dot in this graph so that's why it's a dot chart next we move on to the measures of central tendency okay so the first one is the mean or the average so what is that it's so basically you know it's the sum of the observations divided by the number of observations you know simple average that you take of a data set okay next we have the median so what is the median the median is the midpoint of the data okay whatever which data is at the middle of your data set okay so how do you calculate that so first you have to you know order your data from smallest to largest or other way largest to smallest and then if your sample size is odd then median would be the mid value if your sample size is even then the median would be the sum of the two middle values divided by 2 okay very simple calculation so that's what the median is it defines the midpoint of the data and then the third one is mode which is basically the most frequently occurring observation in the data so in this case you count the number of repeats in the data we we'll look at this example so suppose i have a data set which looks like this 10 11 15 14 15 and 10 so how would i calculate the mean so i'll just take the sum of all these numbers and divide it by 6 because i have six observations so sum of all these numbers is 75 divided by 6 my mean is 12.5 simple next i calculate the median so you know in order to do the median first i have to order the data so i have ordered my data from smallest to largest so i have 10 10 11 14 15 and 15 now see over here i have even number of observation right so i won't have you know one single value for the median just from the data set itself the two middle values over here are 11 and 14 because beyond 11 i have two data points and after 14 i have two data points so this is the middle of the data basically it's between 11 and 14 so i take the two middle data i take the sum of that and i divide it by 2 so 11 plus 14 25 divided by 2 again the median is 12.5 so the mean and median are same over here and what is the most frequently occurring value here it's the 10 and the 15 because 10 is also occurring twice 15 is also occurring twice so the mode is 10 and 15 now in a data set you can have either one mode so those are called unimodal data so suppose imagine you know i had you know three 15s over here so then my mode would be 15 but you can also have data sets with you know different number of modes so you can have a bimodal data you can have a trimodal data multimodal data okay depending on you know how many modes you have okay so this is how you calculate the mean median and mode now a question for all of you and, and again you can you can use the chat box to answer it uh, let's you know uh, uh, forget about the mode okay let's let's focus on the mean and the median uh, suppose i have 10 11 15 14 15 10 and then 
the next value is 100 okay maybe i i had a typo or you know the, maybe the instrument uh, you know gave me faulty recordings so i have seven observations 10 11 15 14 15 10 and 100 which one out of mean and median do you think would be more useful to uh, you know uh, explain the central tendency of the data and why okay so uh, punam says median dr nikhil also says median okay it excludes extremes median okay okay right so the median is more robust over here why because you know since i am ordering my data so you know if i order my data i will have 10 10 11 14 15 15 and then 100 okay so the median in that case would be 14 right so even if i had a very extreme value my median would, would would still be around you know what would have been you know if the data was correctly captured however <coughs> in case of mean you know you'll have 75 plus 100 so 175 divided by 7 so the mean would be extracted more towards that value of 100 right so the mean gets affected by outlier values whereas the median remains unaffected so that's why you know in many journals or many publications you know, uh, you'll see that, you know, the for the summary statistics, it's the median that gets represented. Why? Because, you know, if you have skewed data uh, where, you know, there might be outliers or, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it might not be symmetric. So in that case, you know, the median gives a better idea about where the average lies as compared to the mean. So that's why the median is more preferred in that case. Okay. However, if it's a symmetric data, then, you know, the mean and the median would always be the same. Okay. And as well as the mode, all of them will be the same. And that's what happens in the normal distribution scenario. Okay, good. Okay, next we move on to the spread or dispersion. So we talked about the values of a central tendency. So whatever, you know, is the average. Now, you know, how much variability is there between each data points or how much variability is there uh, between each data point versus the mean value? or whatever is the in the center. So for that, we use the standard deviation of the variance. So the variance is basically the you know, square of the standard deviation. So what is the standard deviation? It is defined as the amount of variation or discussion. Uh, I, I'm hearing some background news. So can, I, can, can someone kindly mute from your side? Okay. Okay. So, so standard deviation defines the measure of the amount of variation or dispersion of a set of values primarily around the B. Okay. So don't, don't go deep into the formula uh, over here. Just, just understand that over here I have the mean and I'm seeing that how much difference uh, is there from each observation around the mean. Okay. So, 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 so the standard deviation gives a measure of that, that how much dispersion is there among a set of values around their B. So if my standard deviation is high, that means that more values are dispersed, more values are away from the mean. That's why the difference is large, right? So if this difference is large, obviously my standard deviation would be higher. So if the values are more and more dispersed, if the values are more and more away from the average value, that means that I have a highly variable data set. Versus if the standard deviation is small, that means that the values are more closely knit around the mean. Okay. So that means that data has less value. Okay. And some notation part. So this X is the data value. X bar is the sample mean. And N is the number of non-missing observations. Okay. So S is the standard deviation. And if you just take the square of this, so the square root goes away. That's the sample variance. Okay. Again, uh, if, you, if you use the same data set, so this is how you calculate, you know, the variance and the standard deviation. So you already seen that the, the mean of this particular set of values was 12.5. So what I'm doing over here is I'm subtracting 12.5 
from each of these values. Okay. So these are the values that I'm getting. Then I am taking the square of it. So minus 2.5 times minus 2.5, 6.25. And likewise for the others as well. And then I'm taking the sum of all these squared deviations, which is 29.5. And I'm dividing it by n minus 1. So my number of observations were 6. So basically, I'm dividing it by 5. And I get a variance of 5.9 and a standard deviation of 2.43. Okay. So that's the way you calculate the standard deviation. Next is a knowledge check for you. And again, you can either unmute yourself or use the chat box. So suppose, um, you know, there are two diet programs, okay, uh, which aims at reducing weight in pounds during the first week. So these are the number of, uh, these are the weights reduced for the number of subjects. Uh, you know, uh, how many subjects I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I have seven subjects in diet plan A and seven subjects in diet plan B. Uh, these are the you know uh, weights uh, that the subjects have uh, you know reduced after a week uh, of enrolling in the different diet program now just by looking at the data you know which group do you think has a smaller standard deviation and the next question is that you know both the groups have a mean of 7 uh, so now that you know that which diet would you choose if you want to lose 7 pounds i'm already getting some answers Plan B, Plan B, second. Okay. Okay. So most of you are saying Plan B, right? Why do you think Plan B is better? Standard deviation is low. Okay. So as I said that for both the groups, the mean is seven, right? But if you look at the observations, you see that there are more variation. The data points are more and more scattered from that mean value. Whereas if you look into this particular data set, you see that the mean, that the individual values are more and more cluttered towards the mean value. Now, again, by the principle of EDA, if I plot this, you now this becomes more evident, right? So you see that I have more deviation of individual points from the mean, which is represented by this red dotted line for diet A versus diet B. So diet A actually has a standard deviation of 4.3, whereas diet B has a standard deviation of 1. So in order to get consistent result, I would probably enroll myself in diet B because of having a low variability from one subject to another. Okay, So that's how standard deviation helps us to identify whether how much variation is there in the data. Okay. Next is uh, spread or dispersion again, uh, you know, just the other measures. So this is called the coefficient of variation and the range. Okay. Range is more popularly used. Coefficient of variation is not that much, but still you'll see in multiple <coughs> manuscripts, coefficient of variation is uh, represented. So what is this? So coefficient of variation is simply the ratio between the variation in the data by the mean. Okay. So it's the ratio of the standard deviation over the mean and you multiply it by 100 to express it in a percentage. Okay, so that's the coefficient of variation. Now, the higher the coefficient of variation, the greater level of dispersion around the mean. So if your coefficient of variation is high, that means your standard deviation of is high, right? Because that's in the numerator. So if this value is high, obviously the coefficient of variation will also be high. So if your data has more variability, that means your coefficient of variation will be high. Okay. And of course, if your standard deviation is low, that means that you, you are probably having a more precise estimate. Okay. And, and, and as I said, that it is generally expressed as a percentage. The range is simply, you know, the difference between the maximum and the minimum value. Now, again, if you see a wide difference in, uh, you know, between the maximum and the minimum value, that means your range will be high. So that will give you an indication that probably you have more extreme values on either side, higher and lower. So that will again give you an indication that probably you have uh, a huge amount of variability in the data. Whereas if the range is very small, that means that there is very less difference between the max and the minimum value. So that means that probably 
your values are more cluttered towards the mean. So that means you have less variability. So apart from the standard deviation, the coefficient of variation and the range both uh, can also help you to identify whether uh, there is variability and if there is, is variability, how much is that variable? Okay. Again, going back to this example, uh, you know how uh, you can calculate. So you know you calculate the standard deviation of this, which was two point four three. We calculated the mean earlier, which was 12.5. So a coefficient of variation is 19.44%. And the range over here is the maximum minus the minimum value. So the maximum is 15, minimum is 10, the range is 5. And then finally, uh, we talk about uh, the position. So in position, uh, there are two aspects. One is called the quartiles. And the other one is called the percentiles. Okay. So most popularly, the quartiles are have you basically have three quartiles, uh, which divides the data into four equal parts, which is called the Q1 or the 20 uh, first quartile, which is basically the 25th percentile. Then you have the second quartile, which is the median, and then you have the third quartile. Okay. So 25% of your data lies between the minimum value and Q1. Then the rebate, then the next 25% lies between Q1 and Q2. Then the next 25% between Q2 and Q3. And the final 25% from Q3 to the maximum value. So that's why these three quartiles divide your data into four equal parts. Okay. And then we have something called an interquartile range, which is nothing but the difference between the third and the first quartile. Clear? And then how do you calculate the quartile? So basically, the, the idea is pretty much similar to how you calculate the median. So basically, n is the number of observation that you have. So you take the number of observation, and then basically you try to you know weight it by the one fourth for the first quartile. Okay. Uh, for the Q2, it will be basically half, right? So again, you know uh, that means that basically you are calculating the median over here. And then for the third quartile, you add a weight of 75.75. Fine. So that's how you calculate the quartiles. And then the percentile. So, so the quartiles are basically a special case of the percentile because Q1 is basically the 25th percentile of the data. Q2 is 50th percentile of the data. So basically we say, right, that uh, you know, below median, 50% of the data falls. Why we say that? Because, you know, Q2 it in itself is a measure of percentile as well. Okay. So these are the values below which a certain percentage of the data falls. Okay. So Q1 is a special case of percentile. So Q1 is the 25th percentile and Q2 is the, uh, Q3 is the 75th percentile and median is the 50th percentile. Fine. So over here, you are dividing your data into four equal parts. And over here, you are basically dividing your data into 100 uh, parts. Okay, so that's why, you know, you talk about, you know, what percentage of data falls below, you know, Q1 or Q2, whatever, 90th percentile, for example. So that means that 90% of the values are below uh, this, this particular observation. So we talked about the summary measures. Now, how do we... Uh, you know, use the graphical measures. Okay. So the first one is the box plot or the box or whisker plot. So this is a very simple plot. All you need over here is the five point summary. So what is the five point summary? You need the minimum, you need the maximum, you need the median, the first quartile and the third quartile. So imagine, you know, I have a trial of one, uh, you know, of 184 subjects and I have all these values being calculated from the data. So this is about the age, okay? And then I can use all these individual five data points to create the box plot. So it starts from the minimum, okay? You have this line, this is called the whisker. And then you have the box over here. So the box starts from the first quartile. Uh, you define a thick line wherever the median falls. Then you have the box ending at the third quartile. And then you have the maximum. So this is one way of, the box of, of you know uh, representation of the box plot. There is another way where you know you might it, it helps you to identify the outlier as well. 
which looks like this. So instead of the traditional minimum and the traditional maximum, you take the interquartile range, multiply it by 1.5, and then add that to your third quartile. And similarly, you take the interquartile range, which is Q3 minus Q1, you multiply 1.5, and you subtract that from Q1. So from these two new points, the new minimum and maximum, your whisker starts. And beyond these two points, whatever value you might, you might have, those are your outlines. So this is a very simple way by which you, know, you probably can detect that whether you have any outliers in your observation. Fine. So this is a box plot. These are, uh, you know, uh, two other common plots. Um, I mean, uh, we, we have already covered one, so that's why I'm not, you know, talking again over here, which is the scattered plot. So that is also you can use, you know, to identify the pattern uh, between, you know, two 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 set of uh, observations, uh, whether it's linear, quadratic, uh, anything. So that's why I'm not covering over here. So these are the two other common plots. So one is called the histogram. So histogram simply means that, you know, uh, suppose, you know, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm having data on serum cholesterol and uh, say, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm defining the bins as like this. So I have three to four and, and, and this depends on, you know, how you want to represent it. So it can be, you know, from, you know, 2.5 to 3.5, 3.5 to 4.5, whatever. So in this case, it's, it's a continuous, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, scale that I have used. <coughs> so, you know, three to four or, you know, uh, say 3.5 to four and then, you know, uh, uh, 4.1 uh, and then from uh, 4 to 4.5, something like that. And then again, you know, like bar plot, you, you calculate, you know, what number uh, of observations falls in, within that interval. Okay. And then you, you draw this continuous bar plots. So if you remember in the bar plot, it was disjoint, right? So this, the bars were disjoint, but in histogram, they are stacked one after the other or attached one after the other. Okay. And then you can probably get a feel about, you know, how, what the shape of the distribution looks like. Okay. And that's what gives you the density plot. So over here also, you probably would have fitted a curve. Okay, that would have given you the density plot. Okay, and this is also you know the same thing. You know, you basically calculate the relative frequency corresponding to each observation, and you plot them. Okay, in a continuous uh, frame. Okay, so I have two different groups over here: control and treatment. And this is what the density plot looks like. So this is the these are you know some of the common uh, graphs that you use for quantitative data. Any questions? Uh, I think I, there are some questions. Okay. okay so the question, one question was that why uh, n minus one? So this is, uh, you know, uh, a slightly you know uh, more technical topic uh, where we talk about you know unbiased estimator. So that's why we use the uh, n minus one. Okay. So uh, that's that's not uh, you know uh, in 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 scope for today's presentation, but but it's mostly related to the unbiasedness uh, of the data uh, of the estimates. Any other questions uh, corresponding to this uh, quantitative measures and uh, I mean descriptive measures for qualitative and quantitative data as well as the plots? No. Okay. Outlier slider. Okay. I guess this one, right? Okay. So what I'm doing over here is, uh, so let's go back to this example. Okay. So you see over here, the median is 62. The Q1 is 53 and Q3 is 70. Okay. Now over here, what I said was that, that, you know, the, the plots started from the minimum and the maximum, the true minimum and the maximum. Okay. 32 and 81. Now I'm, I'm saying that, you know, don't do that. Instead of that, 
you first take the difference between 53 and 70. So 16.5 is the difference. Okay. You multiply that with 1.5. Okay. And then add it to the third quartile. So 70 plus 1.5 times 16.5. So till that point, you have your whisker. Similarly, you have your uh, Q1 over here, which is 53.5. So 53.5 minus 1.5 times 16.5. Whatever is that value, you draw the line over here. Okay. Now, if 32 is less than that value, it will probably be beyond that whisker, right? Which is happening over here. So that's what helps you to identify outliers. So maybe, you know, you that that 32 was you know due to some measurement error or you know due to some you know unexplained phenomena uh, in the process behind which you know the data was collected so you know all outliers are not bad you know sometimes they they might give some insightful information so that's how you detect it that instead of because if you if you use the actual maximum and actual minimum you you won't get any outlier right because the the plot will start from the actual minimum value the plot will end at the actual maximum value but if you do something like this, that, okay, you know, I don't anticipate, you know, any value uh, uh, beyond my Q1 uh, with the magnitude of, you know, uh, some, uh, some, you know, uh, weight times the interquartile range. Okay. And these are not, you know, like, like the, you know, uh, uh, like, like, it's not always has to be 1.5. You know, there might be, it might be 3.5. It might be 2.5 depending on the context of the problem okay so so by that also you know you can you can uh, you know revise this new minimum and maximum calculation and then check that beyond that you know what are the values that are lying and if they are outliers or not. so this is you know uh, a very simple method to detect uh, outliers in your data okay any other questions uh, before we move on to the next topic I have one question. Yes. Uh, when do we use uh, mode? Because you know, mode is something which is not frequently used. So yeah. I'm just curious no. to know. What yeah. Is so mode. Is. Yeah. I mean, mode. We. I mean, typically don't use it. Uh, it's only like you know, uh, for example, you know, uh, you uh, suppose uh, you know you you have your data set, for example, and. Uh, you know, you initially again, again, you know, going back to the EDA principle. Suppose you initially thought that you know I would, I would uh, probably you know fit a normal distribution. Okay, so normal distribution, if if you if you you know might have seen, it's it's like a bell shaped curve, right? So only one mode. It has it has yes. only one one peak, right? Yes. But now, if you plot the data, okay, or mm -hmm. you know if if you try to calculate you know the summary statistics, now you see that there are two modes. Mm -hmm. So then okay. the normal distribution fitting will not give you appropriate result. So you need to think about, you know, more, uh, you know, advanced techniques like, you know, either, either, you know, a mixture model or, you know, some sort of a spline regression in order to fit the data. So from that perspective, you know, the mode helps you to identify that whether, you know, it, it's, is it, is it really your data has just one peak or there are multiple peaks. And you know the pattern of the data corresponding to each peak is different, and accordingly you 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 know fit certain portions of the data to to handle that scenario. All right. So especially when there is a, a bimodal or a polymodal distribution, we will yes. get to understand you know like a genetic data. You know sometimes yes. you know yeah. homozygotes, heterozygotes, and the uh, You know how it may influence uh, certain let's say pharmacokinetics of a drug. So you may have some kind of bimodal. Yeah. So is it what you're uh, referring to? Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. I think I had another question. So 1.5 that I multiply. So, so 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 depends on you know how much you know uh, you know deviation you you kind of anticipate. Right. As I said, that you know, uh, you know, it doesn't has to be one point five. <coughs> it can be two. It can be three. Okay. So you know, you, you know, imagine you know, if, if you have a huge data set, 
and you know you you want to figure out that you know uh, uh, you know maybe you know I I'll, I'll look uh, and and you, know, you might have some information by by looking at the plot that you know there are few values which are too low. Uh, so so obviously you know you 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 will say that you know if I go twice uh, as as my uh, interquartile range uh, from from either side of the uh, Q1 and Q3, I I would expect you know uh, some some outliers. So accordingly you 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 modify it. So it's not like like the you know standard. Uh, it's it's the most commonly used. So that's why I have used this 1.5. But it can be 1.5, 3, 2, 2.5, depending depending on the context. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Shall we move on to the next uh, topic? Okay. Uh, this one, I, 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 I hope you know uh, all of all of you will 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 enjoy. Uh, and again, you know, it's it's going back to the uh, you know, EDA EDA principle. So I'll I'll focus mostly on the some some good graphical principles, you know, that that we should uh, apply, uh, or why you should avoid third pie charts. What do you mean by third or oh, three D pie charts? Okay, uh, there there will be an example towards the end of this uh, uh, end of today's presentation, where where I'll show that why why it's a menace. Okay, so uh, kindly, kindly, you know, hold on, hold on to that question, Kalpita. Okay. Okay. So uh, before moving into that, you know, as you see, or you might, you might have observed that, you know, in, in, in medical research data, uh, apart from, you know, using the, the, you know, the quantitative summary measures, quality visualizations are, are becoming a very, you know, critical uh, aspect. And, and, a, and a very key component uh, by, by which, you know, you, you interpret your data. And with, with, you know, now more advanced tools uh, and, and softwares, you know, you are, you are able to make more visually appealing as well as, you know, more uh, insightful uh, graphs, uh, which probably were not possible a few years back. So that's why, you know, even, you know, from the decision makers' perspective or the regulatory agencies, they are also, you know, encouraging that you, you provide quality visualizations and they are becoming very critical you know in, in terms of appropriate presentation of the data okay now why they are important because you know they are able to efficiently and effectively translate the key clinical messages so rather than looking at you know uh, you know uh, two three pages of tables uh, which is also summary uh, if i just look at a, a graph maybe i'll be able to get that insight okay so you know, I'm I'm spending less time. It is more visually appealing, and of course, you know, you know, uh, you might have heard of this of that famous wording, right? A picture says a thousand words. So that's why you know they are they are they are now you know playing a very critical role in order to translate you know very key very key important clinical messages in the data. Now, in order for a graph to be effective, uh, first of all, it has to be easy for the audience to understand and decode. Okay, so you know, some if, if some layman is looking at it, so they they must be able to understand that what 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 is the story that you are trying to tell. You know, you might you might make a very complex graph uh, using very advanced tools, but you know, if you are not able to gather any information from that, then it's it's meaningless to do that. So it should be easy for the audience as well. Okay, and uh, you know if you look at you know the current medical research publications or even regulatory sub submissions, you'll see that you know there is still a room for improvement uh, on well-designed graphs uh, for using them as powerful communication vehicles. Now I don't know if you know this particular gentleman, uh, a very underrated statistician in my opinion. So this is uh, Edward Rolf uh, Tuft. Okay. So he is an American statistician and uh, professor uh, of political science statistics and computer science at Yale University. And uh, he's particularly you know, noted for his writings on information design and considered as a pioneer uh, in the field of data visualization. So, you know, I, earlier I mentioned about you know, going through you know, some of the seminal works of uh, John Touquet. 
uh, I would also echo similar, uh, you know, sentiments for uh, Dr. Edward as well. That you know, if you have time, you know, you can go go through his websites, his published work. Uh, they're they're really amazing and you know very very you know simple to start off with, and it, it will really blow your mind in terms of you know how well designed graphs are very useful. So he 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 also stressed on the fact that you know of all methods for analyzing and communicating statistical information. Well designed graphics are usually the simplest and at the same time the most powerful. Okay. Now, which graph is most appropriate? You know, I, I, I gave you, you know, several examples that you know for qualitative data you can use a bar plot, you can use a pie chart, you can use a dot plot. Uh, for quantitative data, you can use histogram, uh, box plot, density plot. Now, which graph is most appropriate? Now, it depends on the distribution detail level. So, for example, if you have, you know, summary level data. So, if, if you follow this particular two-sided arrow, if I'm moving towards right, I'm mostly talking about summary data. If I'm moving towards left, I'm talking about raw data or more granular data. Okay. So, if I'm moving towards the right, so I'm talking mostly about low level of detail. So if you're interested in low level of detail, so mostly in, you know, summarizing the data or, you know, communicating a very concise message. So then, you know, you can utilize the mean, median, IQR, 95% CI, et cetera. And then, you know, in that case, you know, you can use a bar plot, uh, you can use a dot plot, you can use a forest plot, okay? Because those are all based on summary data. You see, box plot is you know somewhere over here. So you know it uses <coughs> summary level data, but you know probably it, it provides slightly more information, or you probably need slightly more information rather than just the summaries in order to uh, explain the data pattern. So you have box plot over here. Now, if you move more towards the fine granularity, so then you have to rely on cumulative distribution plot. You know, in survival, we use the Kaplan Meyer. Then you have, you know, the density plots, the QQ plots, the violin plot, which we will cover. So these are all, you know, working with the raw data, the individual data points. Okay. So over here, you have more higher level of detail. Uh, these are more granular. And these are, you know, mostly used for, you know, analysis and exploration. So if your goal is to use summary data and you, to, and you just want to provide or you just want to get some concise information, then you can, you know, lie in this particular zone. However, if you want to, you know, do further analysis or exploration and you're dealing with raw data, then the suggestion is that you use plots which are in, in, in this particular region. Okay, so that's why, you know, which graph you want to use, it is important depending on, you know, how much detail uh, you want to go into. Okay, now, in terms of the qualitative data, uh, you know, again, you, you see over here that, you know, for, for pie chart, you know, it is not recommended. It's, you know, mostly it is avoided. So if you have, you know, one level of interest or more than one level of interest, you know, stick, stick with the bar plot, okay, or the dot plot, okay. Or, you know, if, if you have, you know, different groups, you can, you know, compare them in a single chart. Okay, to, 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 to get some more insight. Okay. The other aspect is that, you know, what kind of graph subtype uh, you want to have, you know, either you want to keep it simple, you know, just, you know, either one group or maybe two group, uh, whether you want to keep it multi-panel of simple. So, you know, probably I have just two groups and I'm, I'm providing them, you know, side by side or bottom down, whatever it is. Okay. And then you have, you know, grouped or multi-panel or grouped. So over here, you know, it's 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 a grouped uh, dot chart. Okay. Over here is a multi-panel uh, of of you know uh, uh, of of group chart. So basically, you know, over here I'm 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 using the color coding for different years, and then I'm using different panels for you know different sources or different regions. For example, over here, you know, I am using different years. Okay, for the same uh, you know, observations uh, at, at different time points. So depending depending again, you know, what, what you want to uh, portray 
how you want to portray you have to be very care uh, very careful in terms of what graph you are using so it depends on the level of information you have or level of information you want to you know uh, portray uh, it depends on the kind of data you are dealing with and it also depends on you know uh, you know how you, how you want to have the layout okay if if you if you if you are able to strike all those you know then then you are basically hitting the jackpot so that's that's what our aim is to to hit that jackpot the maximum number of times so how we can make you know more meaningful graphs depending on you know which graph is most appropriate from one situation to another you cannot just use or pick one particular graph uh, which is might which might be relevant for a one situation and then try to force feed it for you know a totally different situation you have to be mindful about that okay so there are certain best practices uh, which uh, you know you you need to apply in order to improve your graph and this is basically coming uh, from you know a joint working group which is called the safety work uh, graphic working group so this is basically a group comprising uh, people from fda uh, different pharma industry as well as academia the goal the goal of them is basically to develop you know uh, uh, a wide array of graphics uh, which it can be used for visualizations of clinical trial safety data so if you if you click on this particular link you will see that depending on what kind of data or what kind of domain you want to look in what information you want to see you will see that it it gives you you know different graphs and subgraphs corresponding to that so it's a very useful resource uh, you know if if you want to understand that how you know data needs to be presented graphically okay and then their goal was to you know make a publicly available repository of sample graphics which is you know this 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 particular page okay and uh, the the broader goal was you know to educate and engage stakeholders through outreach activities so from time to time you know they they have you know a common uh, uh, you know uh, meeting or you know they they conduct workshops across you know different uh, regulatory agencies or you know different uh, companies or you know different institutions uh, in order to educate more uh, about uh, the, the the proper use of graphical principles okay uh, so they recommended you know the nine best practices you know for generating statistical graphics okay so i'm not going through that you know that will be that will be available in the backup slides um uh, and so you know their their more uh, their, their more emphasis was you know that statisticians you know should should be encouraged and to to adhere to these principles uh you know uh, just as carefully you know uh, how we you know uh, <coughs> scratch our head uh, in terms of you know the proper assumptions of statistical models multiplicity adjustments etc so you know not only focus on the you know the the core analysis part but even from the visual aspect from the exploratory aspect also i uh, you know we should you know spend some more time uh, and apply the you know best principles to make you know graphs more visually appealing and more useful okay so i'll, I'll cite some examples that will help you understand that you know what what do i mean by that okay so i will focus on you know these four uh, important principles so the first one is that you know you need to tailor each graph to its primary communication purpose uh, the next one is maximize data to ink ratio the third one is bring items the reader needs to compare close together and the fourth one is use the simplest plot that is appropriate for the information to be displayed so let's begin with this one okay so as i mentioned that you know you can use box plots uh, to display quantitative uh, safety data so for example over here we have a box plot of lab parameters uh, corresponding to a different drugs so i have a low dose high dose and a placebo group uh, and at different time points at baseline at week 2 and week 4 so you can see over here that you know i was talking about that outliers so maybe you know they have considered this you know 1.5 times or you know twice the interquartile range on either side uh, uh, of the q1 and q3 Yeah, and and you can see you you are able to plot some outliers at baseline and week two. Okay, so I hope that 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 clarifies the the initial query. Okay, so now this is this is fine. This is well accepted. Now we can do better than this, right? How we can do better than this? 
we use something called a violet dot. So this is also, you know, providing the same information. But now what it does is that it adds a density plot to each side of the box plot. So thus it provides more detail about the data distribution. So now if you look over here, you can see that, you know, uh, the shapes of the distribution look somewhat different over time and by frequency, right? If you, if you follow the shape over here, the, the distributional pattern, you know, corresponding to each treatment across the time, you see that the patterns are changing. Am I right? Okay. So box plots are fine because, you know, they are showing the, you know, you know more distributional detail than, you know, probably a dot plot would do. But now, you know, the higher level of detail that the violin plot is giving, you know, this allows the reader to assess the distributional shapes, which are not captured by the simple summary statistics. Okay. So this is, you know, you know, if you can, you can tailor your, you know, already, you know, existing good graph uh, to, you know, enhance uh, the, the, the communication. So you can have a box plot, but you know, you can enhance it by using a violin plot that probably adds, you know, more detail to the communication. So that's one example. The next one is about maximizing the data to ink ratio and bring items, you know, the reader needs to compare or, you know, uh, closer together. So over here, what I'm doing is I'm plotting the uh, systolic blood pressure uh, at the end of treatment corresponding to different treatment groups. So I have a control group and for the drug, I have a low, medium and high, uh, mild and high. And then for each treatment group, I have males versus females okay so now over here uh, you know uh, apart from that you know what has been done over here is that you know the 95 percent confidence interval corresponding to each doses you know has been provided okay Now, this is a very common way, you know, by which, you know, data are graphed uh, by the use of bar plot, uh, you know, with an error bar on top, okay, as well as the sample size. So this 48, 52, 51, 56. So these are basically the sample size above the error bar, okay. Now, the problem with this is that, you know, this creates an optical illusion, you know, by, by creating this ad, you know, visual addition to the actual data value itself, which is basically the height of the bar. Right. So over here, the height of the bar represents the mean, but there is no additional information, you know, apart from, you know, that is inherent in the bar itself, other than this, you know, single numerical value. So, you know, I am unnecessarily spending here, you know, excess ink, you know, I have some unnecessary information here. It's, it's, it, 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 it gives me an illusion, you know, is this 48 the mean? Or is this 48, you know, the sample size? So there is no clarity over here. Okay, so this is basically, you know, misuse of resources, I would say. So instead of that, you see, this one is so much minimalistic, but at the same time, it is providing the same information in a very quick and clearer way. So now again, I have, you know, uh, the different groups which are color coded differently. Uh, control and, 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 you know, three different uh, drug levels. I have the males and females, and I'm just providing their mean along with their 95% confidence interval. Okay. And over here, you know, I'm also presenting their sample sizes. So, so now, you know, the things are more clear that I'm, I'm defining that this is the N. Okay. This is the, this is the, uh, you know, uh, values. Okay. At, 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 uh, you know, uh, baseline. Uh, corresponding to each of these uh, groups. And then whatever happens at the end of treatment, I am plotting them. Okay. And then I have, you know, a mean difference, you know, difference from the control. So for the drug high, what is the difference with the control group? For this particular dose, what is the difference from the control group? For this one, what is the difference in the control group? So you see, I have less, I have spent so much less ink over here. Now, you know, every information is so much meaningful. Every information is so much easily deciphered. 
So someone looking at this plot versus this plot, you know, they would they would probably prefer this one, you know, because you know it 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 is visually more you know appealing in terms of providing the right amount of information. So that's what I mean by you know maximizing the data to ink ratio. Let's look at the third example. So how you can use graphs that augment traditional methods of displaying data. So this is a very standard, you know, uh, adverse event table, right? So you have, you know, number of subjects uh, with an adverse event, a number of subjects with a severe adverse event, and then, you know, uh, you, you further categorize them with the uh, system organ class or preferred term, okay? That's fine. That's, that is, you know, acceptable uh, across different uh, health regulators. But can you <coughs> add further to it? We can by doing something like this. So this is basically, you know, a time to event visualization of common adversity. So not only I am able to provide, you know, the number of subjects with a particular adverse event, I am also providing, you know, the, you know, journey of each subject. So you know what what was, you know, uh, at at what time points, you know, the 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 event occurred, whether it was consistent across different groups. Okay. If if one particular uh, adverse event you know happened at a later time point versus the other, okay. So all this information you know I am able to uh, provide visually. So traditional method is fine, but you know if you are able to augment that traditional method, you know there is no harm in doing. And this is one way of you know uh, doing that. Now I'll talk about some innovative graphs. Okay, uh, can you tell me you know what what this is? This is not noodles, by the way. It's an Italian dish. Spaghetti. Spaghetti, right. So why I'm showing this? Because you might have seen uh, plots like this, right? Which are called spaghetti plots. So basically, you know, these are, you know, time plots of, you know, each individual subject corresponding to a particular variable. So in, 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 in this case, it is HbA1c. Uh, I have two different treatment arms and I'm, I'm plotting, you know, for each, so each line represents each subject, how, how the values have changed over time. Now, for less number of observations, suppose, you know, I have five or 10, this is fine because, you know, I'll be able to understand, you know, what is the pattern in terms of, you know, HBA wants increasing or decreasing over time between the two treatment groups. If I have 75 subjects, you know, now if I have 100 subjects in each arm, I am hardly able to, you know, visualize in any particular trend, right? It's all, you know, uh, entangled over here. So no clear trend or pattern is observed in this kind of spaghetti plots. So now we have something like this. Can you tell me what this is called? This is also an Italian dish. So this is called a lasagna, okay? And it looks like this. So all I am doing over here is that for each treatment arm, you know, again, I, I have the month over here and I have the value. So I'm, I'm so, so imagine that, you know, corresponding to each period, I'll have a rectangle, okay? And I'm color coding it. And then I'm stacking it one after the other, okay? So if, if I just focus on this particular part, so maybe this is one subject uh, who was diabetic, uh, you know, at, at visit zero. Then at month six, uh, the values uh, increased uh, uh, and, and uh, decreased, I'm sorry, uh, and came between 6.5 to 7.5. Then again, you know, it remained increased for a long time uh, between 7.6 to 8.5. And then again, it got reduced. Okay, if you look at this particular uh, portion, just you know, at, at the extreme bottom, you know, this is probably you know one subject uh, which was showing values consistently between six point five to seven point five, and then after this particular time point, they are at high risk, at risk. Sorry, so so the so the so the, so the uh, HBA one C value is going down. Okay. So each stack represents each subject. So I'm, I'm able to, you know, follow their journey over time 
I'm just color coding, you know, each uh, value corresponding to each time part. And now the pattern which was I was not able to identify using the spaghetti plot, I'm able to identify using this lasagna plot. This this is also you know sometimes called a heat map. Okay, where you know you can you can uh, you know identify the pattern over time. So this is you know an an innovation that that you can implement uh, corresponding to a traditional plot or you know a more uh, commonly used uh, graphical method. Imagine you you have a data set like this. So suppose you know you have subject, uh, you have the visit, then you have the change. You know so so change from baseline, uh, you know corresponding to say you know uh, tumor size or you know any 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 kind of response, and then you know you you have the uh, you know categorization of that change. So is it a complete response? Is it a progressive disease? Partial response, etc. Okay, so typically people would do a bar plot in this case, but you know there are further innovations uh, over the bar plot. So you can think something like this, which is called a spider plot. Okay, so over here, what I'm doing is that you know for for each subject, uh, I'm I'm plotting you know uh, I'm basically color coding the response categories. Okay. And I'm plotting them over time. Okay, so I on my x-axis I have the week, and my y-axis I have the change from baseline percentage. Okay, and you know I can I can further add some legend that you know whether whether there is a growth in target lesions or you know growth in non-target lesions etc. Now again, <coughs> uh, this would probably be applicable for you know a less number of subjects, but you know instead of a bar plot saying that you know how many had uh, complete response. How many had partial response? I am not. I am able to show that as well as you know how that you know uh, response is uh, modifying over time. So that also I am able to provide. This you might have seen in in multiple manuscripts, which is called the waterfall plot. Okay. Again, you know the idea is same that for each subject I am plotting the change from baseline. I am color coding it in terms of treatment one and treatment two, and then these letters over here indicates the different response uh, categories. Whether it's a complete response, partial response, stable disease, disease progression, or non-stable, whatever. So this is called a waterfall plot. This is called a swimmer plot. So you know, suppose you know, uh, I on my x-axis I have months. And uh, I'm I'm basically you know trying to uh, plot the number of subjects you know who have received the drug, okay. And then uh, you know uh, basically I'm I'm color coding it by the disease stage, and I'm seeing that at each time point or at different time points, you know uh, what kind of response I am receiving. Okay, so you know a subject starts from here. You have from this time point a complete response start. Okay. And then you know uh, the response ends over here. Okay, so this is so this is someone who is at a stage one. Okay, so this is also something you know you can you can add uh, you know corresponding to a bar plot. So each bar over here represents uh, one subject in the study. Okay, so I'm again you know able to understand you know how the disease is progressing or getting better over time. This is another, you know, uh, modification of the bar plot uh, or the bar chart, which is called the butterfly plot. So over here, you know, I'm I'm just plotting the cholesterol level counts by gender. Okay, so you know, I'm 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 probably you know be able to understand the distributional pattern of the difference between the two groups. Okay, or 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 from here as well. You know, I'm I'm plotting the best overall response corresponding to each subject. In previous therapy versus current therapy. Okay, so bar plot, bar plot can can also might provide you with the same information, but you know these are you know, visually more appealing and intuitive in in some way or the other. Okay, this one you know suppose you know you have treatment emergent adverse events, right? So you have two different groups, and you are you are you are uh, you know summarizing the different adverse events the counts okay so you can have something like this okay which is which is called the funnel plot 
okay so over here you know each of these symbols indicate different adverse event and what i'm doing is basically you know i'm i'm plotting you know the the, the percentage of subjects uh, corresponding to uh, each okay and then i'm calculating the odds ratio so i have this data so from these data i am calculating the odds ratio corresponding to each adverse event category and i am plotting it okay so basically you know if if i see more values over here so that means that you know for these adverse events you know it is more favoring the placebo whereas if i lie on this particular zone it means that you know it it favors the treatment okay so the odds ratio plot so this is this is called a funnel plot so this is you know now widely used uh, in 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 clinical trials as well as in publications so you might have something like this but you know this is providing uh, more insights in terms of understanding that you know probably which adverse events are occurring more in the placebo group versus the treatment group this is another uh, you know uh, new uh, uh, plot uh, which is called a tree map so over here all you are doing is that you know you you create rectangles and sub rectangles where the rectangles you know the the first rectangle the big rectangles which are basically in terms of the standard of care so you have soc1 soc2 soc3 so these are you know the, the size depends on you know the number of subjects corresponding to each soc and then you further break it down in terms of the preferred terms corresponding to each soc okay so this will give you you know just at glance rather than looking at a big table you know which socs are more frequently occurring and within each socs which preferred terms are more frequently occurring okay so 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 just you know uh, it 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 augments and you know uh, makes you know more visual help uh to to identify any patterns in your data this is another innovation so you know this is something what we called an uh, you know interactive plot so uh this this is you know the the screenshot how it looks like i've also added the reference so if you if you click on this you will find <coughs> multiple examples of interactive chart but let me show you an example that that we did so imagine you have a trial where you have different subjects and corresponding to each visit you are calculate you are calculating the creatinine the albumin whatever is the weight of that subject and what treatment they have received okay now imagine you know for for hundreds and thousands of subjects you know if you look at the listing or even at the summary you know it will take some time to identify you know how how the changes are happening over time from one visit to another instead of that if i keep something like this you know which is which is you know an, an interactive plot a dynamic plot okay so where you know i'm i'm color coding you know the different treatments so red green and blue and i'm you know the the size of the circle represents you know the weight category so suppose you know i have uh, you know uh, weight uh, below 95 then 95 to 100 uh, uh, and then you know uh, anything uh, you know beyond 100 to 105 you know just just rough example so i am categorizing uh, so basically each subject is categorized corresponding to their weight and then you can see that you know for each visit it it shows me the pattern how the values are changing over time so this i think you know would be much more helpful and and also you know time saving in terms of understanding you know how and of course you know you can you can further enhance it by you know you you can probably you know add legends corresponding to each circle representing the subject number uh you can you can add a, a pause button at each particular visit whatever you want to all those uh you know uh, additional uh, enhancements uh, you can you can add different widgets we can add but you know you can you can you can realize that you know how much meaningful and helpful uh this this would be uh, you know as as comparison to you know a, a 10 page listing of the same so these are some of the innovations you know that are coming up you know in 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 clinical trials and you know the regulatory agencies and even the publications the journals they are also you know kind of uh, encouraging us to 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 provide uh, such such outputs okay so some remarks you know about the graphical technique so and as i mentioned that you know uh, 
which graph we are using you know that has to be based on very careful consideration because you know there are certain important principles you have to keep in mind you know what type of data what kind of summary you are trying to measure uh, what level of detail you want to go in and depending on that you know you apply the best practices you also you know need to get the feedback from other disciplines as well you know sometimes you know when you are interacting with your medical colleagues you know they might you know give you some you know uh, advice that you know i you know from a medical perspective maybe this aspect needs to be highlighted in the plot so you know we as as statisticians you know we we, we should be you know uh, uh you know working you know as as in a in a team to uh, make sure that you know if 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 those can be implemented okay and of course you know as i mean this again would would not you know coming come up in one single day again it, it takes practice you need to understand the principles the rationale but you know uh, once you do it you might need some time you know they are very effective and you know they are also becoming very fast and powerful in terms of communicating key findings uh any questions at this time point uh this is the last section so i'll just you know show uh, a few examples uh, before closing in so uh, yeah so i uh, maybe we'll be able to you know finish it by 5 or you know slightly uh, beyond 5 but any any questions at this time point i am yet to answer this question right that why 3d pie chart should be avoided so that will be answered in this section any 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 anyone has seen uh, the 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 the, the uh, you know previous uh, plots the the innovative plots or you know the uh, practices about you know improving the current scenarios anyone has any you know practical experience or real life experience Or 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 was it you know totally new for for all of you? Any limited microarray heat map? So microarray heat map, yeah. So so that that is you know somewhat in line of uh, the uh, uh, lasagna plot that I was talking about. any limited number of subjects for waterfall plot so there is no you know uh, limitation but you know if you if you look at the plot itself uh, yeah so you know for a for a phase 2 trial uh, uh, you know probably that that would still be fine you know for because you know uh, given given you have less number of subjects and and eventually you know since you are uh, if if you just have you know only two two groups or even just you know oh no, only one group so basically you know this particular part will expand right so you will have more expansion on 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 the horizontal axis so i think you know for a for a phase 2 uh it it will still be you know fine phase 3 you know if you move you know go into you know like 500 600 subject maybe then you know uh, it might become a bit cumbersome uh but you know definitely in phase 1 phase 2 you know it's it's recommended and it's used also can you please explain how to interpret the violin curve okay okay so a violin plot is is just you know an extension of the box plot so you know uh, over here also you know i'll be able to uh, uh, you know see whatever is the q1 q3 median all thing but now along with that i am also able to understand the distributional pattern so if you look at this particular uh, uh, set of observation so these are the number of subjects who received placebo at baseline right you see that there are two peaks so this distribution is multimodal right which is not you are not able to find that over here so this is an additional information that you are getting from the violin plot it's just the same thing right it's just you know a mirror image uh, of one another just to you know uh, you are doing it on either side to to make it look like a violin so you can even you know think about 
you know just uh, putting a finger on one side to to understand what the distribution looks like okay if you look at this one you know this one is in a fairly bell shape right uh if you look at this one you know it has extreme value so you know it it, it has extreme values and then you know there is a peak okay so you know this one probably has outliers which which might affect the mean in 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 some way or the other now you see the journey of this one once you know you are come, you are into week 2 you see that you know instead of multimodal now you know it, it is becoming you know unimodal right uh this one you know it was still you know slightly you know flattened over here uh the ones who receive low dose over here you see that you know they are they are becoming you know more smoother okay so uh you know and and then for this one you see that you know it was very sharp over here the peak now it's it's becoming smoother right and 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 then again at at, at the final time part so it, it gives an idea about you know uh you know uh, so for example uh yeah so for if, if if i look look at you know the low dose you know so maybe you know i even even at baseline there were you know uh, uh, quite a lot of subject with you know uh, uh, low erythrocyte value right because you know you, you see beyond this median you know this part has more data the lower part right but now when I move to week two, you know, these are more like evenly spread out. So probably I'm seeing an improvement with the low dose. And that's why, you know, it is becoming more smoother so that, you know, I, I see, you know, subjects pushing from this region to this particular region to make it, you know, more smoother. So this is how, you know, you get the additional information uh, using a violin plot that, you know, which are not possible by just looking at the five point summary. How can P be on both sides of waterfall plot? Okay. Okay, you're, you're, you're talking about these P's, right? Yeah, so I, I think, I, I mean, this is this is just for representation perspective. Uh, so so basically, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, in, 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 a, in a way, you're, you're right. That, you know, if, uh, if, if, if it's a disease progression, then, you know, probably, you know, uh, the, the change would be, you know, uh, uh, I, I would expect an increase in the uh, uh, tumor size, right? So yeah, so maybe you know, it's it's uh, the the coding might be you know, an increase. But this is this is just for represent representational purposes, okay? That you know you can use these uh, you know letters to to indicate uh, you know the uh, uh, disease criteria or the response criteria, and you can use the colors to differentiate between the two treatment groups. Okay, that's all. Does it affect study as well in the violin shape? Uh, can you can you clarify deep? What do you mean by you know? Does it affect study as well in the violin shape? Maybe you can unmute and uh, in week two, placebo has also responded well. Does it affect study as well in the violin shape? Uh, again, you know these are just for representational purposes. Okay, you know these are these are not you know real life uh, study examples, so as to speak. Okay, now I'm not sure what you what you mean by affect the study, but you know if 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 you are probably seeing you know similar uh, you know uh, improvements using a placebo versus a low dose. So maybe you know the low dose is not as effective uh, in in terms of you know improving the uh, uh, this 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 particular parameter. So 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 that might be you know uh, and 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 uh, interpretation that that you can do. Okay. Any other questions before we move on to the last part?
Okay, there is one question. Okay, so so all all the burning questions regarding the pie chart will be will be answered. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you know I'll I'll just you know focus on I think uh, uh, three to four examples where you know they are uh, what we where we saw you know and you know <coughs> not only in Pfizer but you know in other uh, you know uh, uh, companies or you know other uh, research areas. Okay, so this is a very very you know common mistake that that people make. So summary measures for ordinal data. So suppose you are collecting data on severity of headache, you know, for a clinical trial to treat migraine. So the levels of severity, you know, in, in most scenario would be mild, moderate and severe. So ordinarily in nature, right? Now you can use, you know, different. Uh, so when, when you are basically collecting the data, you might assign some numbers corresponding to these categories. So mild might be one, moderate might be two, severe might be three. What is shocking is that, you know, there are published studies, you know, with results which show summary statistics of severity of headache with a mean of, say, 2.3, standard deviation 1.68. You know, it is meaningless, right? And what does 2.3 headache means, average uh, headache means, where I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the severity of the headache. So, you know, in this case, simply, you know, a frequency, percentage, a bar chart, so those would have been, you know, much more meaningful. You know, if if you even if you want to do over time, you would be able to understand that you know what pattern is there uh, in terms of the severity, whether they are improving or you know not improving over time, corresponding to different treatment groups. But you know, when 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 you do summary statistics, and and it's a very common mistake of you know using summary statistics for data which are ordinal in nature. So it is it should be you know strictly avoided and and, and rectified. Okay, so the major issue over here is that you know we need to use appropriate summary measure depending on the nature and scale of data. Fine. Okay. Now comes the uh, important part: pie chart. So suppose you know I I have you know a fictitious data about different categories, A, B, C, D, E. Okay. So, you know, uh, if I ask you, you know, uh, what is, uh, you know, which one, uh, which group has more frequency as compared to other, what would be your responses? Seeing some response, so we're seeing C. Okay, so uh, majority agrees that C is more A and C are equal. Okay, what about F? No. Okay. Time for the big surprise, huh? So this is what the actual data is looks like. Okay. So A actually had, uh, you know, the uh, mo most uh, frequent counts. Okay. Followed by C, F, B. Okay. And uh, there was, you know, D as well, which is, you know, slightly, uh, you know, uh, uh, more than zero. But, you know, it's not visible over here. Right. So that's what I mean by the misleading visual perception that uh, a 3D pie chart gives. That, you know, uh, you, are, you are not able to gauge, you know, which one has uh, the major area, which category. So, in most cases, if you are able to avoid it, just avoid it. Instead of that, use a dot plot or a bar chart. That's much more helpful. Okay. Okay. 
next is this one so uh, this is you know uh, again uh, a major problem where uh, you know uh, you need to appropriately handle the uh, quantitative x axis data and uh, avoid misinterpretation so if you look at the data okay so this is basically you know uh, talking about uh, uh, eye redness so distribution of eye redness uh, so eye irritation uh, over time uh, and uh, i have you know uh, week 1 week 2 week 4 week 6 week 8 and then the end point okay and then i have you know uh, for each time point i have three different treatment groups can you can you can you uh, help me uh, with with uh, a major flaw over here which which one do you think 2d pi is better it is better uh, spider plot no i'm talking about this particular example what 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 is you know a a, a major flaw over here is d comparison values are different okay 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 so this is why i was i was stressing on the fact that you know look at your plot look look at your data very carefully okay the first major flaw you see week 1 week 2 and then i have week 4 so there is a two weeks gap right over here between week 4 and week 2 but if you look at the layout it mean it seems that all these visits are equispaced which which are not you know week 1 and week 2 fine if it was week 3 i would have you know agreed that okay it's fine but it is week 4 so obviously it is giving me you know a, a, a visual you know a misconception that <coughs> the visits are equispaced so that's that's one flaw okay the other other aspect is that you know much of the ink that has been spent over here it does not help me in interpretation of the data you know in fact the most important message is you know somewhat obscured over here don't you think what is the main information over here? The main information is the percentage of subjects along with their confidence interval or some measure of variability. Now, it is not clear what is this measure of variability, right? The other thing is that, you know, uh, all the ink in the bars, you know, that it, it basically obscures this information. In, in, in this case, only the heights of the bars are important. Okay, so even if it, they were filled or not filled, you know, it would have provided the same information. So why would I, you know, spend so much ink, you know, to, to make this, you know, eventually it is not giving me any additional information. Right. The, th the, the next problem is the end point. Again, you know, suppose if at this point, you know, the, the primary efficacy analysis or safety analysis was done, you know, this is not demarcated as the with with respect to the rest of the visits it seems that you know after week 8 there is one end point so even if you know probably this might have some importance you know from the context of the study it is it is it is not justified over here okay so these are you know uh, some of the major problems that is there in this particular data and again you know this th this type of practice is widely prevalent okay so how how we propose we say we, we do something like this. So now you see, you have, you know, week two, you have week one over here. And now you see, I'm, I'm taking that considerable gap that between week two and week four. So now I'm, 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 I'm you know, being mindful of that gap between the visits. So now, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't seem like, you know, it's like uh, one, one week after uh, another. So that demarcation I'm able to make. The next one is that instead of you know spending so much ink over there, I'm I'm just using you know these you know means along with the uh, you know whatever measure of variability you know the so in this case it's a ninety five percent confidence interval. So 
I'm, I'm able to get, you know, whatever is the mean value corresponding to each treatment along with the 95% confidence interval for all the treatment groups. And at the same time, I'm also providing the number of observations at each visit. And then finally, I'm separating this endpoint visit, okay, which was not done earlier. So these are, you know, some of the enhancements, you know, which, which you know, we, we propose that would make it, you know, much more helpful. And this is the final one, you know, again, you know, with some, you know, advanced graphical techniques, you might, you know, provide something like this. So, you know, maybe in context to some, uh, you know, parameter, you're comparing the treatment and the control, but, you know, you need, what, what is this doing? Okay, so, so you need to avoid, uh, you know, display as little information as possible. So, you know, it is providing so many information, you know, what, but, you know, at the end, you know, what is, what is this? It's not adding anything. Right? I mean, why not, you know, just, you know, treatment control, I, I provide the percentage. Why I would you know, spend so much time in doing this, you know, 3D kind of a plot, where eventually I'm not able to understand anything from this. Okay, and and of course you know there there might be you know other other uh, issues as well you know uh, in, in, so 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 we mostly interact with the you know, programming team uh, when when you know we we work on any uh, study related submissions or publications or any uh, you know, uh, data cutoff uh, uh, whatever whatever might be the milestone so there might be you know issues related to you know uh, proper uh, improper derivation of in you know, a particular variable and all that. So, so that 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 happens from time to time, but you know these are you know some of the major ones which I thought um, I, I I would focus, which you know might you know uh, trickle down from you know even from from medical or from regulatory uh, to stats and program. So that's all my, for my uh, presentation. Uh, I would be happy to uh, take in any further questions.